Okay. Um, fun note, I realized that I don't know if it's this format or another, but we now have more reactions. So as I'm going through things, feel free to hit your reaction buttons, which is also down on that bar. Excellent. A whole bunch of new fun ones. So. Okay, hopefully you guys are seeing my screen now. Yep, we can see your screen. Okay. So as Stephanie said, my name is Emily Zobel. I am the senior ag agent for Dorchester County, and I also happen to handle the master gardeners for Dorchester County. Um, and today I'm going to just kind of do a quick fall insect update. Just basically go over some knowledge and refresh some stuff about some insects that you guys may be seeing out in the fall now and or may potentially become issues as we go into the winter. Um, I've kind of got a fairly so-so list, so we'll go through these until my time's up. Um, if you are interested in a PDF of these slides, you can feel free to email me or I will send them to Stephanie and she can send them around to everyone who registered as well. So don't feel the need to like frantically scribble down notes. Most of this information is either on the Home and Garden Information Center's website or it's on other um, extension websites as well. Okay. So some good general tips for you guys, um, and this is both for fall and spring and basically throughout the year, is as you're getting ready to put in your fall landscape plants, if you're getting new ones, make sure to check them closely for insect pests. And this would be things like mites, this would be things like scales. Also, as you're getting ready to bring in any of your less hardy plants, inside you also want to do a thorough check. I'm not going to talk too much about household pests, but I know that this is the prime time when we start bringing in our more delicate plants. And you last thing you want to do is bring in a whole bunch of those outdoor pests into your house and then have to deal with any of those as you go forward. No matter what chemical you are using, even if it's organic, please always read and follow the label and the directions. This is gonna tell you how to use it safely and properly and effective. If you are having a hard time reading the label on the actual container because it's super small, just Google the name along with label and you will be able to find a PDF copy online, which will be nice and big and you can print it out and you know, take it with you. If you are having trouble with that, reach out to your extension office and we can help you find the label so that you guys know how to use these chemicals effectively. If you are not comfortable using these chemicals, then reach out to a arborist or a landscape company. And there'll be sometimes when I say that that might be the smarter thing to do, because particularly if you are doing something um, when we're talking about scale insects or mites, if you need a systemic insecticide that needs um, like a drench or something like that, those are rather difficult sometimes to measure out because you have to take the girth of the tree into consideration. So I actually recommend going to an arborist or to an actual pest control company to do those. Just because if you do them wrong, then they either aren't going to be effective or you have the potential to poison some of our beneficial pollinating insects later on. And then also keep in mind that just proper fertilization and irrigation will help a lot. If you have healthy plants, that can go really far in making sure that they are not prone to some of these insect pests. A lot of our insect pests, particularly things like the boring insects, really do prefer weakened plants. So by keeping your plants healthy, you kind of decrease the likelihood that those insects will be attracted to them and or that that insect population will actually be lethal or super detrimental to that. So again, that proper fertilization and irrigation goes really far. And as we can see from these past two years, year to year, this can be dramatically different. I mean, last year in the summertime, you were watering, hopefully, most of your garden daily, if not every other day, because we had that drought. And this year in the summer, you didn't need to water anything once we got into that rainy season we had. So this can change up dramatically. Um, and of course, always take a soil test before you fertilize. 
you need to know what you need to do. Okay, so the first insect I want to talk about is hibiscus sawfly. And this is one that you will find on our perennial hibiscus plants that are coming, becoming more and more popular. Um, but basically what happens is it feeds on the foliage and you can see it here and it does a lot of that skeletonization window painting feeding. Um, you're going to first see them out in May, but they will continue to have multiple generations throughout the year and they will even not be out there until the first frost. The main thing is you're never gonna just get one of these guys. They tend to like to have friends with them, so they are going to be feeding in groups. It is rather unsightly, but in all reality, unless your entire plant has feeding on it, this is not likely going to kill your plant. So what you can do is leaves that are incredibly damaged, like the one that's seen here in the picture, is you can easily just prune those ones out. Um, particularly if you do this early enough in the season, this will kind of trigger uh, the plant to create some more foliage and get a little bit more bushier. But if it's this late in the season, at this point, your plants have basically finished photosynthesizing. So I would say if it's really unsightly, and you personally don't like it, you can take it out, but if not, I would just leave it. You can also use Spadocin, but again, make sure you read and follow those labels. So the next insect that I wanna talk about is fall webworms. You are gonna find these on things like mulberry, walnut, hickory, elm, sweet gun, oak, and linden, just for a few um, examples. What they do, particularly at the terminal, so at the tips of your leaves and branches, is they will create these web nests. And the caterpillars basically live inside this nest and they will enlarge it and or leave it at nighttime to feed. Now these can be uh, rather unsightly, but again, unless you have them all over your tree, are not likely going to really harm a well-established tree. If you have kind of a brand new sapling that you put in, this year and it's you know only six feet tall or something then yeah you probably don't want these on here but if you have a giant oak tree that's been on your property for 20 plus years this isn't going to kill it um this isn't even going to really do that much damage because again at this point in the season our plants and trees particularly have done most of their major photosynthesizing so the loss of some leaves isn't a big deal if you do find these unsightly, you can very easily take a elongated pruner and just snap these pruner bits out. You can also take a big stick and just rip this open. Um, that will kind of allow some of the caterpillars to potentially fall out and they will likely not be able to crawl back up. So the next one is the mimosa webworm. So this one is very similar to the fall webworm in that it spins a web around, in this case, the leaflets. Um, and you can see the picture of it here where it's kind of combined them. You will find this on mimosa as well as honey locust. Um, I would not recommend uh, that you plant mimosa. And if you have it, I'd recommend getting rid of it. I believe it's considered an invasive plant at this point, but someone can double check that. I mean, I'm a bug girl, not a plant girl. So I don't always keep track of all of them. But again, um, if you choose to have them, just be aware that this may potentially be a pest on those. Here in the Mid-Atlantic, we do get two generations. So you'll get one around mid-June and then you get a second one that came out in August and is out now here in September. So you may want to uh, take that into consideration. Um, for your control, you really, for hardcore control and any sort of chemical control would wanna save that for the spring population it's not really worth controlling the fall population, which is what we have now, because a lot of them aren't going to survive overwintering anyways. So you're sort of kind of wasting time and energy. So instead, what you can do is rake up any of the leaves or debris, because while these insects will live up in this web, they will come down through the debris and overwinter in the leaf litter. So by raking that up, you're sort of, again, eliminating the numbers that are going to survive into the winter. You can also prune any of these kind of webbing out 
as well as you can kind of rip that webbing open and that will expose these to predators and to parasitoids. So it's sort of a more natural, nice way to kind of go about controlling them. So I do want to also take a sec to remind you guys that we do have a handful of stinging caterpillars um, here in Maryland. So particularly these three are the most common that you will come across. So uh, the puss caterpillar, just let me get my laser pointer, which is this guy. He's a very nice fluffy caterpillar. Um, he kind of looks like a little toupee that's crawling around, but hidden amongst those lovely Fabio flowing locks are some spines. And those spines, if you were to touch this, would break off in your finger and they would have venom on them. So none of these caterpillars have what we would consider a traditional stinger the way like a honeybee or a wasp have a stinger. It's basically just spines that have venom on them. So you wanna be careful not to touch these guys if at all possible. Um, but that being said, you're not likely going to encounter these in your home garden unless you have a lot of native plants because most of these generally like to feed on native plants more so than they like our more commercial ones. So the next one is this one, which is the saddleback caterpillar. And he's only about an inch to an inch and a half in size. And you can see he gets his name because he's got this little saddle sitting on his back but it's pretty obvious that he's got lots of spines on him. And I will say I have been stung by one of these guys and it was not a fun experience. Um, I was working in a cornfield and got smacked in the leg and it stung me through my blue jeans. So again, it's, they do, they can get you a pretty nasty one in it. I had a, a pretty nasty itchy blistery rash for about a few weeks and how Detrimental it will be was going to depend a lot on how much venom you get in you. So if it's a light brush or in this case, like it got smacked and pushed through my blue jeans versus also how sensitive you are in general. So if you're someone who's very sensitive to say like bee stings and insect venom in general, then these stings will probably be worse than someone who is not incredibly sensitive to it. So that's something to be mindful of. The last one is the eye moth caterpillar, which is this one. And again, you can see all of these um, little clumps of hairs and spines that are all stinger-like. So again, you just wouldn't want to touch this. In the event you come across one of these in your garden, and it, particularly if you have grandkids or someone like that, all you need to do is just scoop them up in a cup um, with a little bit of cardboard and then just take them and move them outside of your garden. All of these guys, again, uh, you're not generally going to find them in large amounts and they all normally feed on native plants, but they are really good in our ecosystem still. So you don't necessarily want to go about smushing them. None of them are really detrimental with the exception that they sting. And I will say both the eye moth and the post caterpillar, which is the southern flannel moth, are really, really beautiful moths. Um, the saddleback's kind of just a normal gray moth, but you know, they're still moths. They still have some environmental um, needs to them. So we don't necessarily want to go smushing these guys just because they potentially sting. We just want to make sure that we stay safe. So again, just scoop them up in a cup. If you want to wear some thicker gardening gloves as you do it, that's fine. But you don't necessarily need to go hosing down your porch or anything like that. I've definitely had people call me who have found these and you know, are getting ready to like leave their house and burn it down because they think that somehow these are super detrimental. So just be mindful of them out in the garden um, as we go into the fall season. So one of the other caterpillars that you will find out during this time of year, uh, you're not likely going to see, but because they are inside trees, but this is the banded ash clear wing. So this is one of the clear wing moths which happens to be a boring moth. Um, this should not be confused with the banded ash borer, which is in fact a beetle. This is a caterpillar, so you can see up here in the picture. And you're particularly going to find these in ash trees. They occasionally will get into some other trees, but for the most part, if you're only going to really find these guys in ash trees. So if you have ash trees on your property, you may want to take some time to walk around 
and inspect them over the next few weeks to see if you potentially have these. And again, this is a great example of if you have a tree that is stressed, these moss will kind of clue in on that and they're going to choose a stress tree over a non-stress tree. So the best thing that you can do is if you're noticing these or any borers around any of your trees is to go get that soil test and then make sure that your tree is as healthy as possible. So the adults will emerge in the fall, they'll mate, and then the female will lay her eggs on the bark of the ash tree. The larvae will then hatch out and will chew its way into the ash tree and will live and overwinter in, in the ash tree. They will pupate next year and then they will emerge in the fall next year. So they spend the majority of their life inside that ash tree, which makes controlling them very hard because the likely of you getting any kind of real chemical on them or anything like that is slim to none. You can potentially do like the parasitic nematodes, but you're going to have to find all the holes and basically squirt those straight in. So again, the best thing you can do is just keep your trees healthy. So some signs that you have these guys will be dieback taking place, and this can be on one specific branch or this can be across the whole tree. Um, generally speaking, if it's across the whole tree and you're having lots of borer holes, your tree is probably past the point of really being able to save and you'll likely have to take it drown. But by increasing its health, you can keep it alive a little bit longer. Um, particularly with those holes, these are going to be slightly larger than your boring beetle holes, but they still should only be, you know, like about dime size. The clue that you've got these instead of say the banded ash borer or the emerald ash borer is you're going to one see lots of frass because these guys tend to push their frass back out so that's going to be like a sawdust like substance and you'll see it either sticking out of the holes or you'll see it around the base the other thing that gives you a clear giveaway that you've got these versus any of the beetle borers is that when they go to pupate they have their pupation case right at the exit hole so that when they are done pupating, they can literally fly back out as a moth. So if you check holes and you're seeing this, so this is their exoskeleton from pupating, that's a dead giveaway that you had clear wing bores and not any of the beetle bores instead. And again, control for these is going to be really difficult. So the best thing that you guys can do is to just keep your plants healthy if you feel the need to do kind of some more hardcore control, if you have lots of borer holes again, and you needed to do something like put in a systemic insecticide, so that's an insecticide that your tree would take off and like incorporate throughout it, um, you would want to go ahead and contact a pest control company or an arborist because most of those chemicals are restricted use and then figuring out how much you would need to put in in order for the hardwood instead of the leaves to get the chemical is a little bit more of a trickier process if that's even possible. Um, normally we'd recommend just keeping the plant healthy and then when it's basically dying and you need to removing it and replanting it with something else. But I know there's a lot of people who have a lot of sentimental feelings, particularly around certain trees. So they will go to great lengths to save them. So um, yeah. Okay, so bagworms is another one that you guys will see uh, around this time of year. Um, and chances are if you have conifers on your property, you probably have a handful of bagworms and they've probably been there all summer, but when they start off, they're super tiny. And by now, they're several, they're like one to two inches in length. So they're, they're pretty good size. You can see the bag right here. So now that we're into the fall season, what basically happens is the uh, caterpillars that live inside of these bags will pupate. The females will stay inside their bags and the males will have wings and they will leave their bags. They in turn will find a bag with a female in it and they will mate. She doesn't even have to leave her house guys to find a man, like he just comes straight to her. After they mate, she will lay her eggs and then she will die and her eggs will overwinter inside this bag. Then next spring, normally around May, those eggs will hatch, the larvae will crawl out and a lot of them will do what we call ballooning. So they will make a very fine piece of silk 
and the wind will catch that and blow them around. So that's how they'll kind of spread out. So if you have um, a tree with just a handful of bags on it this year and you've got a lot of conifers around it, you'll likely get more next year because they will spread out from that one central location. So what you ideally want to do is go through and hand remove and destroy as many of these bags as you can. Um, and this doesn't necessarily have to be done this month or next month, but just throughout the whole winter, every time you're kind of out in your garden, go walk around your conifers and yank some off. Um, if there are some that are too high up, again, if you've got kind of some extended pruners, you can prune them out. If they're way up there, you know, I wouldn't, uh, if you don't feel safe getting on a ladder, I wouldn't necessarily do a ladder to remove them. Again, you could consider contacting like an arborist or some other company to come help get rid of them. Or if you've got a really infested tree that's already kind of heavily defoliated, you may consider removing it and putting in something else. But you know, this can, can be a management project throughout the entire winter to work on. Because if you do get a heavy infestation of these guys, they can defoliate your conifers pretty heavily. Okay, so another common conifer pest that you're gonna get this time of year is the spruce spider mite. Um, so this isn't an insect, this is a mite. So these are small little single um, region arthropods that are rather tiny. You're probably going to need a hand lens to really see the spider mites, but you'll notice their damage before you kind of notice them. And that's going to be some yellow stippling all along the needles. Um, the needles will then turn yellow and then over time will eventually turn brown. You will likely also see some webbing on them, which is what you can see in this picture here. So you can see the yellowing needles and then all this webbing right in here. Um, there is also the russet, the rust spider mite, which can also get on conifer trees and cause similar damage. Um, it's a lot smaller than these, so you definitely would need a hand lens to see it, but it doesn't create the webbing, but you would go about controlling them the same. So if you are not seeing the webbing and you think you may have these, one of the easiest things to do is just get a clipboard and stick a white piece of paper on it and then go out there and just tap some of these branches over it um, and take a hand lens with you and then take a look at what falls off of these branches and you're going to see sort of little dark mites. Um, they kind of look like someone took just ground pepper and sprinkled it across the paper. And if that's the case, then you probably have spruce spider mites. So if it is a smaller conifer tree, um, you can take a hose and kind of just give it a good wash down. And it, the setting that you set your hose on will again be based off of kind of the size and how durable your tree is. But you'll want to make sure that you kind of start at the top and wash your way down and make sure you get the undersides as well and that you don't neglect those lower branches because a lot of those are where these guys will be. And basically this won't eliminate the mite population completely, but it's going to knock the population down enough that you shouldn't have too much damage on your tree in the future. Or if you do this and then wait a few days and apply a horticultural oil, that will also increase the likelihood because you've already knocked the population down. And now you can use an oil to do a little bit more of a population knockdown. I do want to say do not use a horticultural oil on blue spruce trees. They are incredibly sensitive to horticultural oil. So if you do use that on blue spruce in particular, it will likely burn the plant, which is worse damage than the spider mites ever would have caused in the first place. So do not use it on that. Um, you could use like a horticulture soap potentially on it or something else. The water in particular is really great just for the blue spruces. Okay, so now I'm gonna move into talking about some scale insects. And I do wanna take a sec to just talk about how to go about controlling scales uh, in general, just because uh, if not, I'd be repeating the same instructions on every single slide. So if you have areas that are heavily infested with scales and it's just like the twigs or one branch, consider pruning that out. That's a really nice, easy way to kind of get rid of them. That's not very time consuming. 
Um, you cannot show wash any reachable branches or the trunk with a mild soap solution and a soft scrub brush. Um, this is a, a great activity for kids and grandkids too. You just say like, we gotta go out there and wash our trees. Uh, if you have soft scales and they're making honeydew and spinny mold, uh, washing can also help to remove that off of your plants as well. So you do want to treat scale insects when the crawling stage is active, and that's when you would use something like a horticultural oil or an insect growth regulator for it. Um, and all the insects or all the scales I'm going to talk about next are all ones that are going to be active now and or active in the winter, which is why I'm talking about them now. Um, you can potentially use dormant oils, which are basically a higher concentration of a lot of the horticulture oils. And you would want to apply those sometime during the fall. Normally you want to wait until it gets a little bit colder. So those would normally get applied in like end of October, beginning of November. And then again, a second round in that late winter, early spring, February and March. And what these particular do is the higher concentration during that winter time will kill any of the overwintering nymphs or the crawling stage. And then again, if you do have some really heavy populations, uh, you can do a soil drench of a systemic insecticide next spring. But again, I would recommend rather than trying to do those on your own that you contact um, a landscaping company or an arborist because they can be a little tricky. And particularly with the springtime ones, if you don't time it right, that systemic insecticide can potentially get pushed into the pollen and nectar and can hurt some of our pollinators. So you really need to get the timing right if you're doing soil drenches with systemic. So again, that's, that's a little bit better just to contact a specialist for. Um, again, when using any of these things like the horticulture oil or the growth hormones um, or even the dorm oils, read and follow those instructions. Um, those are a law. By purchasing the chemical, you've agreed to follow those instructions. So do read the complete label and follow them. And again, if you're having a hard time reading the label because it's super small and you need a larger copy, reach out to your extension office. Um, again, you can easily Google the name of the chemical and all companies will have the labels saved on their website as a PDF. Or if there's a phone number, you can always call the phone number and ask them to email you the PDF of the label. Okay. So the first scale insect I want to talk about is the tulip tree scale. This is going to be a pest on yellow poplar, tulip tree, magnolia, and linden. It's about six to seven millimeters in diameter. It's oval and convict. And it has a distinct rim around it. Um, which I'm not sure if you can really see, but like when you look around the edges here, you can kind of see it's got like a little bit of a marking here. So they're flattened, but then they have like a little bit of a rim to them. So like here's the con paved part. And then this bit right here where the highlighter is, is the rim. They can be in like a grayish green color or in this pinky orange to a yellow tune. So what you're seeing here is the pinky orange color. The crawlers or the nymphs, will be dark red when they hatch and then they'll turn to a gray color later on. And if you were to scratch these guys open to try to figure out if they were alive or dead, if they are alive, the female is going to have like a pink orange coloration to her, which is both her internal fluids as well as potentially any eggs underneath her. So she has laid her eggs um, and her crawlers will be hatching sometime between late August to early September. So now would be the time if you have a tulip tree to go out and check to see if you have them. You'll probably need a hand lens to see the crawlers, but you can also use something like double-sided tape around some branches to see if they're out there to figure out whether or not you need to treat or not. So, and then here's just a zoomed in picture. So these are the females and you can see all these little gray dots here. These are the crawlers, so they are very tiny again. So you likely want to pull out that 10x hand lens to take a look at them. Okay, so the white pinnacle scale is also active right now. 
And this is one that you're going to find on a wide range of host plants, a lot of your prunus species. So things like cherries and peaches and those stone fruits. It tends to really like those. You're also going to find it on boxwood, which you should just rip out anyways. Um, <laughs> I am notoriously known for not liking boxwoods. So I would tell you to take it out and replace it with a nice native bush. But nonetheless, if you are really in love with your boxwoods, check them out for these. You're also going to find this on cherry laurels, red twig dogwood, anonymous, uh, magnolias, and privet. And the adults are going to be round and they're normally going to have a yellow or brown dot. So here's our adult scale. So you can see her, she's kind of, um, she's round, a little kind of clam-like shape, and then she's going to have this brown and or bright yellow dot, which is right there. The crawlers are normally pinkish in color, but they can be off a little. So like in the picture here, these are more yellowy in color, but they can be pink. Um, we do get three generations here, which is why you can get kind of these larger outbreaks like what you're seeing on this plant here. So the first generation will be in May, and then you'll get another one mid-July to mid-August, and then the final one will be near the end of September. So again, now would be the time to go out there and check and see. You can try to knock down the population as it goes into overwintering. Um, this is also, you could hose this down to try to get off some of these older scales and so forth. So the magnolia scale is another one that is out about now. This is really common on the star and the saucer varieties of magnolias. Um, you're also potentially could find it on Virginia creeper. The nice thing about these guys is they tend to like the younger woods. You're not going to find these so much on like the trunks or the large branches as much as those twigs. So these are a great option for ones that you can prune out very easily because they are just on those smaller twigs. The adults are going to be about half an inch in size. So they are big size scales, as you can kind of see here and here. And they have the shiny tan brown color. Um, they will be this color. And then by midsummer, they're going to cover themselves with a wax. But then they will actually get rid of the wax when the female starts to lay her eggs. So that's where it's kind of like, you can see in the picture here, some of them still have some of their wax, which is the white ones, and then some of them haven't. So the crawlers are generally a dark color, so they are a little bit harder to see on the plants. But again, you can use things like double-sided tape or even that paper trick. If you go out there and kind of shake these branches, some of these crawlers potentially will fall off. Um, and the eggs are gonna hatch again late August, so those crawlers are probably out about now. If you do have a heavy infestation of these, they can cause some twig and limb dieback. So, and repeated heavy, heavy infestations can weaken and potentially kill particularly newly planted um, trees. So again, if you have one of these trees and it's been in your yard for years and it's super healthy, you don't necessarily have to worry about it dying because of these, it's just the unsightliness of them. So that's where going out and washing it and pruning it and all that would be good. But if you do have a newly established um, one, you may want to be a little bit more careful about it getting these. And again, if you did need to do something like a soil drench, you would want to wait until springtime to do that. Okay, so the crepe myrtle bark scale, this is a newish invasive scale. So it was found down in Texas in 2004. They actually confused it with one of our native scales that it looks like, um, I believe this is Azaleo scale. This one is native to Asia, but it has slowly been spreading and making its way up. It was found in Virginia last year or the year before. It has been found and confirmed in both Frederick and Carroll County here in Maryland. I think there's one or two other reports, but we haven't been able to have anyone go out and confirm them yet. Um, but nonetheless, if you have a crepe myrtle, tree on your property, please check it for this. If you think you have it, please contact um, Extension and we will see about either having one of us come out to look at it or potentially um, someone like Stanton Gill or uh, Dave who will be speaking to you guys later. So the adults are going to be about two millimeters. They're going to be white and gray and they are going to be covered in that white wax. So these guys are soft scales. And 
the crawlers are going to be this nice bubblegum pink. And if you break these scales open, they will also be a pinky red color inside as well. So that's how you know that they are still alive and these aren't dead scales. You're likely going to find these guys on crepe myrtle, but you can also find them on things like apple and persimmon. If you have edible fig trees, they again do like things like boxwood, American beautyberry, privet, and then they have also been found on raspberries as well. Hey Emily, just doing so, a time check. It's 9.40 and this section ends at 9.45. Then we have a 10 minute break between 9.45 to 9.55. So we can do Q&A during the break. Okay, cool. Um, so these guys can be found throughout the entire tree. So you'll find them on the trunk, they'll be on branches and on twigs. They do tend to like to be on the underside away from sun exposure. So if you look here at the picture on the left, so this one was one, was a twig that was in the shade and this one was one that was in the sun. So one way that people are talking about combating these on your trees is to make sure that you prune them in a way that the majority of the plant gets a lot of sunlight. So don't particularly if you're getting ready to plant a crepe myrtle tree, don't plant it in some place where it's going to get shade from another tree or from your house. You really want to get it in particularly a full sunny spot. Um, the picture here that you can see on the right has kind of the black sooty mold all over the crepe myrtle and that's again from the honeydew that these guys generate off of them. Um, if you are buying a crepe myrtle and putting one in, again, check it before you put it in. And if all possible, you wanna check it at the nursery. And if you're seeing scales or anything on any plants that are at the nursery, consider going someplace else and letting the people who operate the nursery know. The one then, the two ones that we have had confirmed, both of those were plants that were newly bought and brought up and the nurseries purchased them from um, growers who are down south where the scale is more common. And again, if you do think you have it, please report it if you think you have it. Um, we'd rather have someone come out and check and see if it's there or not. You can take pictures and also send them into. I know during COVID times, we're all kind of getting a little bit more uh, back and forth on whether or not to do particularly things like home visits, but if you think you have it, um, try to snap some really nice pictures and send them to the Home and Garden Information Center or contact your local Master Garden Coordinator to kind of see. You can always, you know, snip some, a few twigs off and bring us a sample to take a look at, and then we can always pass it up to the higher ups as well. So here's an example of the damage that they can do. So the crepe myrtle tree on the left that's in full bloom, this one was sprayed and treated to control them and the one on the right wasn't. So you can see there's a lot more big blooms on this crepe myrtle than there was on this one. So these guys aren't, again, going to likely kill your tree, but they can definitely stress it to the point where it's not putting as much energy into things like flowers and blooms as it normally would. So this is your general reminder that the spotted lanternfly is out and about. Um, now would be a prime time when you guys would be seeing the adults as well as hunting for those egg masses and scraping them off. And here's again what the egg mass looks like. It's kind of just a big gray blob. So you would just want to take something and scrape that right off your tree. It has been confirmed in Cecil, Hartford and Washington County here in the state of Maryland, but you can see um, it is actively moving up in Pennsylvania. So if you are going up to PA to look at uh, fall foliage at some point over the next few weeks, please, please make sure to check your vehicle before you come back. And the pink dots show you where one has been found, but there's not necessarily like a growing population yet. So you can see most of the counties in central Maryland have had at least one confirmed spotted lanternfly adult found. It's just a matter of they haven't found nymphs in a growing population. So this is one that I think over the next few years we are going to see spreading out. So please keep an eye out for it. If you have any last minute straggling tomato plants, you may or may not find a hornworm. If you find one like this that's parasitized, please leave it. You might do a few more bites in your tomato plant, but for the most part, 
he's not going to do much. And we want these parasitic wasps to be able to keep living so that they can go parasitize more hornworms next year. Now is a great time when you guys are going to see a lot of the gorgeous orb weaving spiders. Um, you may potentially see the black and yellow garden spider out in your gardens. Um, you may also find the banded garden spider, which will look really similar to this, but it's going to have bands of black and white and yellow um, next to your house, particularly near where lights are. You might find things like the cross orb weaver or the Hertz orb weaver. Um, we also have the marble orb weaver here. These guys really like to build webs um, late in the evening by lights so that they can catch a lot of insects that are getting attracted to your lights. So if you do not want these potentially near your entrances, um, one thing you can do is make sure that you turn off your lights when you go to bed and that will deter them. And you can also just take a stick or a broom or something and just knock the webs down. And the spider will go find another place to build her web. Um, now is also an awesome time where your black tail swallowpiller Swallowtail caterpillars are actively going to be feeding on things like dill and parsley and fennel and Queen Anne's lace. Um, so you can go out there and take a look at them. I think they're really fun and fascinating. You don't, however, need to get super worried about what to do if they eat all of it. Um, by the time they normally have finished eating all of the plant, they are ready to go pupate and they will not pupate on the plant. They tend to crawl and find some shrubbery to pupate in. So don't get too worried. I know I had someone last year who called freaking out because all of the black swallowtail caterpillars ate all of her dill and she was going to the stores and buying it and putting out there in jars for them. And you, you guys don't need to do that. Remember that these guys are wild animals, but they are really fun to kind of go out there and look at. Kids generally kind of like to study them. Um, so if you have parsley or carrot or celery or fennel or dill or Queen Anne's lace nearby, Go check it out. You may or may not have some black swallowtail caterpillars. And with that, um, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Awesome. So we do have a lot of questions. Um, just for everyone, we are technically on our break right now until 9.55, and then we'll come back with Kurt Vollmer for the WEEDS presentation. Um, but for now, through the break, we're going to go through all the questions from Emily's presentation. So starting out, we had a question, um, so a lot of comments about the sawflies. A lot of people said that they um, saw less sawfly activity when they had more nesting birds in their garden. Um, we had a question about should we feed sawfly to the birds in our feeders? So I wouldn't say that you actively need to like gather them up to put them in your feeders. Um, if they're there and the birds want to eat them, the birds will find them. If, you know, you might try moving your feeder a little closer to where you are finding the soft flies, or you may decide like, okay, I'm not going to feed the birds for the next two days with the hopes that they will go out and find soft flies and eat the soft flies instead of the bird seed. Because you've got to realize like the soft fly is like a healthy vegetable for the bird and like the bird seed is like a chocolate cupcake. Like, are you guys gonna eat broccoli or are you gonna eat a chocolate cupcake? So, you know, and it's broccoli that I have to walk over to hunt for too. So um, if you really kind of have them and you'd rather have the birds prey on them, I would recommend maybe stop feeding the birds for a few days and see if they will move over and do that as well. Awesome. But I wouldn't recommend hand picking them off and like putting them in the bird feeder for the birds. Got it, okay. Um, about what date should the leaves be raked up in the spring? I think this is in regards to caterpillars. It's back from the beginning of the presentation. So um, as soon as the leaves start dropping, I would actually rake them up. Okay. So uh, I know a lot of people like to use leaves for mulch around plants, but I would recommend when you have ones like that where the mulch is ideally where they are actually overwintering, Ideally, you want to rake them up and then go back and use either leaves that are not potentially contaminated with them and or just use kind of normal mulch instead. Okay. Um, when we were talking about the stinging caterpillars that we have in the area, someone wanted to know how large they are. So um, 
Most of them are about an inch or so. Um, the Aya Moth, I believe, is more like two inches. The Puss Caterpillar is about the size of, um, like, well, so the Saddleback is about the size, Saddleback's about an inch. Um, they're rather tiny. The Puss Caterpillar, I think, is about an inch and a half. And I want to say the Iowa one, the Iowa I O one is um, the largest out of all of them. None of these guys are like hickory horn devil size, though. So none of them are like you know the size of your palm. Okay, great. Um, we have one question. Someone noticed a white caterpillar on my red sweet potato vine, which appeared to be eating my plant. Do you know what type of caterpillar it is? So, I. Just off the top of my head, I wouldn't be able to tell you what it was. If you want to email me a picture, um, I can do my best to try to identify it. This late in the year though, if it's just one caterpillar munching on your vines, I wouldn't be too worried about it because again, your vines have done most of their photosynthesizing. Um, you're probably going to be digging up your sweet potatoes in the next month or so anyways. So I wouldn't be too cautious of, about it, but if you really do want it identified just for the sake of knowing like what you're feeding, you can send me a picture or you can submit it to the Home and Garden Information Center. They have a, a pretty good team with doing insects, so. Awesome, and we had a question about the host plants. I think it also referenced to those stinging caterpillars. So they feed on a variety of native shrubberies and trees. I would have to look up each one separately. So if you're really curious, you can shoot me an email and I can get you that. Um, but in general, they tend to just be generalists on a lot more of our native plants. Cool. Okay. And then how do you treat a caterpillar sting if you happen to get stung by one of those? <laughs> so you would sort of want to treat it the same way you would treat kind of a bee sting. So if you happen to get it, I would actually recommend taking something like duct tape and putting it over the sting to try to pull out any potential stinger that was in there. It's not like a bee sting where you can really scrape it out easily. Um, and then you just want to wash it with like cold water and soap kind of pushing against it in multiple directions to try to get any remaining like sting out of that. And then you could put a cold compress on it and then just take something like an inflammatory to deal with kind of any swelling or stuff like that. Obviously, if it's swelling up and a super irritant or you're having a severe allergic reaction to it, then I would recommend going and seeing a medical professional about it. Yes, always good advice. Um, someone did ask how to destroy the bagworms, but uh, shout out to Susan Trice, our coordinator from Frederick County. She answered those in the chat box and we have a lot of other questions to get to. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and move on to those. Um, okay, so our next question is, we had a lot about scale. Um, what do you use to treat house plants which have been outside before bringing them back into the house? Are there any systemic available for home use? So I don't necessarily treat them with much. I tend to um, wash them down to the best of my ability. So I will take them over um, and set them on kind of my porch and I will just wash them down with like some normal water, I'll, I'll mist them down with maybe something with like a little bit of an insecticidal soap. And then when I bring them in, I tend to put them in, um, I have two bathrooms in my house. So I'll put them in the bathroom that I tend not to use and I'll close the door and just keep them in kind of self isolation for a few weeks. So if they do have something like spider mites or a scale or something like that, I have it mildly contained. I'll put some yellow sticky cards in there as well if they have something like fungal gnats, mm -hmm. um, but that's nice. I know there are some people that will put them in like um, clear plastic bags and they'll not like the tops and they'll, they'll bring them in like that and leave them sit. But if you have larger plants, that's not always the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is to find a spot in your house where they're just a little bit more isolated from your normal house plants. Um, I know, uh, I don't think Rachel is on, but I know Rachel Rhodes brought in some house plants last year that had mealy bugs on them and they got mm. all over her orchids and she had to scrape orchid. Oh, there's Rachel. You are on. Yeah. So if you want to know about scraping mealy bugs off of plants, you can contact Rachel because she will tell you all about the great drama that is 
cleaning those off. And I know those came from a Christmas cactus and not from outside, but it's the same sort of principle of just making sure that you're bringing clean plants into your landscape and into your house. Yeah, mealybugs are one of those things that it's usually an orchid problem, but they can come in on plants that you get from any big box store. So um, I used to, ethyl alcohol works really good and a little tiny paintbrush. And that's what I would do every seven to 10 days. I would paint my plants down with ethyl alcohol. And I made a little game out of it with our toddler. So he would sit there with a flashlight and hold it and we would just paint everything down just to get rid of them. And I still haven't gotten rid of them. It's been over a year. So. My goodness. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Good to see you. So, right. yeah. And if you're not emotionally attached to the plant, and it might sometimes be cheaper to take like a clipping or a cutting and repropagate new ones inside and let the whole big plant kind of go. Um, but you can kind of, you know, use, use your best judgment, guys. You guys are you guys know more about plants and insect control than you think you do. <laughs> awesome. So thanks, Emily. We are at time. We do need to switch over to Kurt's presentation. So folks, if your questions didn't get answered, um, Jean has put Emily's email in the chat box and also the link to the Ask an Expert service from HGIC. Um, so if we have time at the very end, we can always come back to questions. But if we don't get time to, feel free to reach out to Emily um, or to Ask an Expert. Thanks, Emily. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. All right, so we are going to go ahead and switch over to Kurt Vollmer, and we're very excited to welcome Kurt. Um, he's the University of Maryland Extension Weed Management Specialist, and this is kind of going to be um, his debut with our Master Gardener team. So thanks so much, Kurt, for joining us today. We're really happy to meet you and happy to have you presenting for us today. So we can see your screen. So take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, make sure I'm in the right mode here. We're seeing in presenter mode. Yes, I'm trying to switch to that now, hold on. Got it, no problem. My saying, I do not specialize in turf and ornament minerals. My specialty is row crops and agronomics. But this morning, I'm gonna be discussing some uh, general weed control practices because uh, weed control, especially with that of herb with herbicides, is dependent on the site in which the chemical is to be applied. And it's not necessarily always a one-size-fits-all approach. So, one of the things I want to discuss is how do we define what a weed is? Um, a weed, um, for most intents and purposes, is a plant that is unwanted or out of place. And that's certainly what we use for a definition of a weed in our lawn or garden. But if we kind of delve a little bit deeper into that definition of a plant that may be unwanted or is out of place, um, there are over 250,000 plant species in the world, and only about 8,000 of those behave as weeds, and of those, 200 to 250 are major problems in worldwide cropping systems. Um, weeds also have certain characteristics that make them weedy. Um, they have abundant seed production. I think, think about weeds produce 10,000 to 100,000 seeds per plant, whereas your garden variety uh, tomato plant will maybe only produce several hundred. Um, weeds have rapid population establishment. Um, weeds also have the characteristic of seed dormancy or long-term survival of buried seed. You know, you see weeds coming up in your gar garden or yard every year even if you see no seeds. Uh, that's because they can you know, last for a long time, that soil seed bank. Weeds are also adapted for spread. Think about uh, the flower head on a dandelion, how, e how easy it is for those seeds to spread. Um, some weeds, especially perennial weeds, will also spread through underground rhizomes um, or tubers. And most importantly, um, weeds have the ability to occupy disturbed sites. 
And that's what kind of what we want to focus on today. Uh, weeds are pioneers. Can everybody see that figure there? Yep, we can see it. Okay. All right. So you think about, you know, this is what we call ecological succession. What happens in a forest? You see in that first uh, top hand pa panel that those trees, you know, nice forest. You've got some bushes. You've got a little bit of grass. You know, it's a nice, well-balanced ecosystem. Uh, but then something disturbs, in this case, say a fire, and you're left with what's in panel four. And, you know, that's probably what your garden looks like before you plant it. Now, the first thing that's going to come up if you don't have a good crop or, or good lawn are the weeds. Always. The weeds are, weeds are colonizers. That's what they do. So, it's important to, so let's look at weeds as symptoms. Weeds, of course, they're, pi they're those pioneer species. They're going to grow in, in gaps. And simply removing the weed may not solve the problem. For example, if you want to get the, rid of the crabgrass in your lawn, um, you could spray it and kill it. But then you have a huge gap in your lawn that's probably going to be filled by more crabgrass. So what we want to do when we're considering uh, weed control tactics is treat uh, the dis disease by looking at these types, many different types of symptoms we may have. Um, again, weeds are symptoms. Um, depending on the species of weed in your lawn or garden, maybe is an indicator of what problems you may have. For example, if you have a low pH soil, and you might see uh, uh, red soil that's more prevalent. Um, for high pH soils, broadleaf plantain, broadleaf plantain is very common at th this time of year. That's, that's a good indicator of you need to adjust your soil pH and have that fertility test. Um, soil compaction. A lot of weeds grow, in, certain weeds grow in high traffic areas. Um, if you have a gravel driveway, footpaths, things like goosegrass, you see a lot of that in high traffic areas. I've also seen a lot of pineapple weed, again, growing in, in uh, driveways and sidewalks, those types of areas. Um, weeds can also be indicators of poor drainage. Uh, yellow nut sedge and Virginia buttonweed both like to grow in moist, uh, damp areas. Another example of poor fertility are clovers in your lawn. Now, clovers are legumes, and legumes, of course, they fix nitro nitrogen. So they're more apt to, be, to grow in low fertility areas um, than uh, a turf or garden species that requires a little bit more nitrogen. Shade, weeds like ground ivy, creeping charlie, or wild violet. Um, this is something I see all the time, especially when, in areas where trees are present. You know, trees provide a lot of sh can provide a lot of shade, and the turf species in your that you have in your lawn may not necessarily tolerate shade as well as this ground ivy or violet. Another symptom of uh, poor management is improper mowing height and frequency. Now, a good lawn, a good healthy lawn is, is the best weed control. And when you think about, and the reason for this is you want to, sh you're, you want to have your lawn shade out any emerging weed seedlings. I know when I was younger, I really didn't like to mow the grass and I would mow the lawn as short as possible to avoid having to mow it again within a few days to a few weeks. But that's not necessarily the best practice because you want to make sure you have a good healthy lawn that should help shade out uh, these uh, weeds, especially weeds like crabgrass and annual bluegrass. 
So, whenever you have a weed that you want to be managed, um, first ask yourself, what needs to be controlled? And then, how much effort am I willing to spend to correct the problem? Again, you can spend a short amount of time spraying something and watching it die. But if you want the problem to really be solved, you'll have to get a little more, put a little more effort into it. Um, get, go, uh, give a little bit more of an ecological approach. So here we have what's called an integrated weed management plan. And these are the basic weed management tactics that I use for what I do with crops and vegetables. And they're also applicable to what you're going to do with your, with your lawns and gardens. Um, they have several basic tactics um, that you want to use. And you want to use more than one of these, these in your approach. Um, Tactics are mechanical, cultural, uh, biological, chemical, and the basis of that is um, prevention. So when we talk about prevention, um, that just means start clean. Uh, use weed-free inputs. If you're seeding a new lawn, make sure you don't have any weed seed in your grass. If you're one of those people who likes to hang a bird feeder in your garden, be prepared to do some weeding. Another important thing about prevention is being able to identify these weed species. So um, today I'm not going to discuss um, uh, weed ID, but if anybody is interested, I would be happy to give a presentation on, later on certain weed ID tactics. But for uh, today's presentation, um, it's best to know the difference between one, a grass and a broadleaf, which I'm sure is pretty obvious to most of you, but as well as the difference between an annual uh, weed, a biennial weed, and a perennial weed. So, as I said before, a healthy garden or lawn is the best weed control. Um, I'm going to make sure you have proper irrigation for your lawn and garden. Also, uh, again, proper fertility. Make sure uh, your, you have enough nitrogen um, and make sure, check your soil pH. Um, for landscaping and gardens, uh, mulch is a good cultural control, control practice. Um, like a healthy lawn, its purpose is to shade out those emerging weed seedlings. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to help with a lot of your summer annual weeds because they, they have small seeds. And if you put the mulch on top of it, there's no, light's not going to reach that soil surface and, and they're not going to germinate. However, uh, mulch doesn't do you any good if weeds actually land on top of the mulch. Um, for uh, mechanical tactics, um, things such as, uh, mo like I said, mowing height and frequency, uh, chopping or pruning the vines, hoeing, and hand pulling. And yes, hand pulling is actually considered a mechanical weed control tactic. Uh, for the next few minutes, I'd like to focus on um, herbicides. Um, of course, we have her chemicals that are both synthetic and organic. Um, Herbicides can be applied either pre-emergence or post-emergence. Uh, for pre-emergence herbicides, they need to be applied uh, before the weeds emerge. They don't do any good uh, once you see that uh, little cotyledon pop up. Um, synthetic herbicides um, usually pro provide a lot of re some residual control, uh, meaning once you apply it, um, you might get uh, two to four weeks of weed control. Examples of those are Balan, Dactyl, and Pendulum. Um, a pre-emergent uh, organic herbicide that's available uh, is corn, corn gluten meal. Um, Post-herbicides, these are herbicides you sprayed after the weed comes up. Um, for synthetic examples, are like 2,4-D, dicamba, and glyphosate. Uh, for organic, you have uh, things such as vinegar and botanical oils. 
a, big, a good difference to remember between synthetic and organic herbicides is a lot of synthetic herbicides can be contact or systemic, while organic herbicides are basically contact only. And when I say, con when I just talk about a contact herbicide, I mean, it's only going to kill what it touches. Whereas a systemic herbicide will enter a plant and move around uh, throughout the phloem and throughout the xylem. Um, synthetic herbicides uh, are also uh, selective. Uh, things like glyphosate or things like 2,4-D will kill your broadleaf weeds, but won't touch your grasses. However, uh, these organic herbicides, vinegar, uh, botanical oils, they are non-selective. Uh, they will kill whatever they touch. Again, contact herbicides. They're on, it's only going to kill what it touches. Um, these herbicides, whether synthetic or organic, are better for controlling weeds when they're small, uh, less than four inches. Again, but coverage is the key. When you spray, when you spray these weeds, you want to spray. Uh, you want to make sure you can t you get spray on all the leaf surface. And these contact herbicides aren't necessarily very effective against perennial weeds, where you need a herbicide to be translocated within the plant. Systemic herbicides, on the other hand, uh, they can be translocated. These systemic herbicides, like glyphosate, will control larger weeds, but spray, still spraying them smaller does provide more effective control, and, it, it, and they are effective against these perennial weeds. Whenever uh, you plan to spray a herbicide, there are a few things to remember. First of all, know your, what your active ingredients are, and this is what's in this red box on the picture. You know, there are a lot of um, herbicides that you can buy from Lowe's and they might have different combinations of these, act, of these active ingredients such as uh, 2,4-D, quinclorox, or dicamba. And when we make recommendations, we kind of make our recommendations based on what the active ingredient is because there's so many different products available. You want to uh, find a, an active ingredient that's going to control that type of product or type of weed. Second is uh, know your lawn. Um, know what type of grass you have because certain herbicides just can't be used on all types of grasses and the same thing principle applies to your garden. Also uh, read the label and know your application rates and timings. Um, pull the label off of that bottle. S see if um, what you want to control is actually listed on the label. Um, it'll tell you how much. To sp it'll tell you how much to spray. Um, looking at application timings. Um, for example, when you look at, at weed control um, with like weed be gone in your lawn, um, it's recommended that you wait at least two days before you before you, after you apply that herbicide, before you mow your lawn. Another thing about spraying herbicides is uh, knowing the weeds life cycle. I mentioned before, you have annual weeds, biennial weeds, and perennial weeds. Annual weeds are only going to live for one growing season. They're going to flower and produce that seed that same year. Examples are crabgrass, and spotted spurge. Biennial weeds, um, they're going to form a basal rosette the first year and mature and produce flowers and seed the second year. Um, biennial examples are musk thistle and wild carrot. And your perennial weeds are going to live multiple years. They're going to produce from tap roots, uh, rhizomes, and tubers, not necessarily just from seed, such as uh, dandelion and nutsedge species. Now, with that, um, different weed life cycles, um, 
will have uh, optimal herbicide application timings. For annual weeds, both summer and win winter annual weeds, um, you want to spray these weeds uh, prior to flowering. I mean, you don't ever want a weed to go to seed. Um, so for summer annual weeds, this usually means uh, spraying the weeds in uh, late spring or early summer. And you may have to retreat these weeds before they reach uh, four inches tall. With biennial, biennial weeds, it's different. Um, the optimal spray timing for these weeds, again, uh, like your musk thistles, uh, is late summer or fall. For the seedlings, um, then you want to spray the rosette in the fall or early spring. The problem with biennial, biennial weeds is once the weeds begin to bolt, and bolting means that bolting is when it shoots up that flower stalk, uh, your chances of control with herbicides are reduced. Uh, for herbicide timing with perennial weeds, again, you want to kind of rely on those herbicides that are going to translocate. Um, and with per perennial weeds, the idea is to get that herbicide translocated down into the root system where it will cause uh, more damage. So you want to spray your perennial weeds in the early bud stage or in the fall, when that herbicide is more likely to be translocated into the taproot. So, um, for the remainder of this presentation, I'm just going to discuss some of the weeds that I've been seeing around and some basic control tips on how to control them. Uh, one of these weeds, of course, is yellow nut sedge. And yellow nut sedge is a perennial weed. It produces from these, um, from these tiny little nutlets you can see in the soil of this picture here and through rhizomes. Um, nut sedge control in lawns, um, maintain a dense turf. Make sure you have you know, enough turf to shade out um, those emerging nutlets. And yeah, don't, don't mow your grass too short. Um, if you have yellow nut sedge in landscape beds, um, you can remove, you can, hand pulling is an option, but you wanna make sure you remove the entire plant. You need to get the rhizomes, nutlets, and all. Um, herbicide applications are optimal in the spring or early summer. Using herbicides with the active ingredients, halosulfuron, um, marketed um, often as sedge hammer or and or sulfentrazone marketed as uh, ortho nut sedge killer among other things. Broadleaf plantain. Um, this is a weed uh, I showed earlier. This is a perennial weed. Um, this is another weed that you can, can then be managed by maintaining a dense turf stand, also uh, relieving compaction by aerating the soil and improving drainage. Um, this is something uh, you, want, you want to eliminate the seeds of this plant prior to flowering. And this is low growing species and it does tolerate close mow mowing. If you decide to hand pull it, um, be sure to remove the entire plant. Uh, herbicide applications need to be made in the early spring or early fall. So right now, right now is a good time to control broadleaf plantain. Um, Pre-emergence herbicides, anything with isoxaben or post-emergence herbicides, um, uh, things with 2,4-D, MCCP, and triclopyr. And I'd like to get off on a little bit of a tangent right now. Uh, I know there was some discussion earlier about how to treat uh, caterpillar stings and bee stings. Well, broadleaf plantain actually does provide a natural antiseptic to stings. So if you pick some, crunch it in your mouth a little bit and apply it to the sting, it does act as a natural antiseptic.
spotted spurge. You know, a lot of you probably see this in your flower beds and your sidewalk. It's a very common weed this time of the year. It is a summer annual. It is one of the most opportunic, opportunistic weeds that I see because um, you see it everywhere. But this can easily be controlled by maintaining that dirt, dense turf stand, um, having the good mulch, and it's fairly easy to pull from landscape beds. If you're going to apply a herbicide, um, make sure you apply it around the early summer before this weed starts to flower. Um, using something such as 2,4-D dicamba or triclopyr or spot treat with, uh, your non, with a non-selective herbicide, such as glyphosate or even some of uh, your herbicidal oils. Clovers, white clovers, red clovers, you see, see it all the time. Again, um, white, white clover is a perennial um, it's a legume. It grows in areas uh, where nitrogen is lower, so increasing your fertility will help to manage the clover, clovers, as well as increasing your mowing height. Um, with perennial weeds like white clover, you don't have a lot of pre-emergence options, so you're pretty much relying on your post-emergence herbicide. Um, things like dicamba, Topiralid, fluoroxapir, and clinclorac. Those uh, again are only effective on uh, broadleaf weeds and they shouldn't touch your grasses. Common Lespedeza uh, is an annual. It's also a, another legume species. So the same principles to, that apply to clover management can also apply to Lespedeza management. Um, maintaining that dense stand making sure that you have good fertility. Uh, Post-herbicide options are basically the same. Uh, 2,4-D, dicamba, triclopyr, uh, MCPA. Uh, violets. Violets are tricky because they some species can be annuals and some species can be perennials. Again, violets are something that tolerates uh, shade and moist soils. But now is the time to uh, control these uh, weeds with herbicides. Um, sequential applications will probably be needed. Uh, with violets, you want to use something uh, that contains triclopyr or triclopyr plus 2,4-D or dicamba. Uh, ground ivy. As I mentioned before, uh, this weed is also known as Creeping Charlie. Uh, it is often commonly mistaken uh, for common mallow. However, uh, Creeping Charlie is a member of the mint family. If you look at this weed, it's going to have square stems, and if you crush it, it's going to kind of have a minty smell to it. This is another species that tolerates shade, um, wet soils and poor fertility, but now's a good time to control it. Um, fall herbicide applications, triclopyr plus 2,4-D or triclopyr plus dicamba in your lawn. Um, for gardens, uh, you can spot spray glyphosate. Um, borax is also another uh, option and yes I'm talking about borax as in laundry detergent um, that can be applied to control creeping charlie and, and turf grass. Dandelion, a weed I know we're all familiar with. Uh, dandelion is of course a perennial weed. Um, Dandelions can be managed by, again, again, increasing your mowing height. Make sure there's enough, enough dense turf stand to keep that weed out. Um, fall herbicide applications now. Um, 2,4-D, dicamba, triclopyr, and lawns, or, or spot spraying again with glyphosate or a non-selective herbicide. 
Um, your annual grasses, such as uh, foxtail, cra foxtail crabgrass and goosegrass. Um, competitive lawn, I'm gonna say it again. Increase your mowing heights uh, uh, to two inches or greater. Um, you, you also want to aerate, have the proper irrigation and uh, fertilization for, to make your lawn uh, more competitive. Um, for, for irrigation especially, you know, you know frequent uh, light watering encourage, uh, encourages shallow rooting and promotes a weak, a weak turf, turf grass stand. It also encourages the germination of crabgrass and goosegrass seeds that are located on that soil surface. Pre-herbicide applications. Um, annual grasses can be managed with these, but it's really tricky as to when you apply these herbicides. Um, for sprint and the sp those applications need to be made in the spring um, before the earliest expected germination period. And for annual grasses, that's usually when the soil temperature reaches about 55 degrees. Pre-emergence herbicide options for uh, these weeds, um, things that contain benefin, oxidiazin, pendimethalin, or if you're going for the organic approach, um, corn gluten meal. Post-herbicide options, again, are things like uh, quinclorac, Noctoproc, uh, DSMA, MSMA, or you know, spot spraying with glyphosate or a contact herbicide. Japanese stiltgrass, not always necessarily a problem in lawns or gardens. It has become, I know it's becoming a lot more of a problem in natural areas now. Um, it is an annual species. Uh, like most uh, cultural tactics, you want to maintain that dense lawn. Uh, if you do a mechanical tactic, hoeing or pulling before pulling this weed before seed drop, and mowing and mowing the, mowing it just before seed set. Be careful with Japanese stilt, stilt grass control because if you do mow it too early. It'll just grow again and reproduce seed. It can be controlled by pre-emergence herbicide applications with products containing trifluralin, uh, pendimethalin, and protamine, and through uh, post-herbicide applications with herbicides containing phenoxaprop. Weedy vines, such as Poison ivy can also be a big issue. Um, not a lot of pre-emergence or preventative work you can do there. Um, physical, contr physical control involves uh, pulling or cutting the vines. Of course, with poison ivy, you wanna make sure you have the proper PPE, you're wearing gloves, um, so you're not getting those oils on your skin. For these perennial vines, uh, synthetic systemic herbicides are your best bet. Things like uh, glyphosate or triclopyr. Um, now triclopyrs are going to work better on uh, more woody perennial vines, while glyphosate is going to work better when they're still in that shrub st stage. Um, for larger vines that may be going up your tree, um, you want to kind of use a uh, multi-tactic approach of both physical and control and herbicide application. And that's called a cut stump approach. So what you're going to do for a cut stump treatment is you're going to actually cut the vine at the soil surface and then immediately apply um, a herbicide usually with a, with a paintbrush. Now for cut stump treatments, um, we're actually working with, we to work with an undiluted chemical, not something that's uh, pre-made for spraying that, you'll, that you buy off the shelf. 
So if you're really doing a cut stump treatment, um, you may want to ask a professional because they may be the only ones licensed for that type of application. Again, for cut stump, tr stump treatment, you're going to cut the vine at the soil surface. That's going to eliminate all the nutrients that are going into the vine up the tree, but you want to apply that uh, herbicide treatment directly onto the stump. That herbicide is then going to get translocated into that, into that root um, and it's going to prevent that root from re-sprouting. And the last thing I'm going to mention are pigweed species. Now, these uh, pigweed species, such as Palmer amaranth and smooth pigweed, are more of a problem in agronomic and vegetable crops. However, I have been seeing more and more of these weeds uh, popping up in containers around town and, and, and as well as in urban areas. Now, Palmer amaranth, this plant on the left, um, it's pretty much public enemy number one with uh, our growers in Mar our growers here in Mar Maryland. Um, this weed grows very fast and it can reach and can grow to be about, uh, or excuse me, grow about two inches a day. So can grow to, I've seen six foot Palmer amaranth plants before. Smooth pigweed, this weed in the middle, a related species, um, looks similar to Palmer amaranth. However, um, if you look at the stems of smooth pigweed, they, they will actually have hairs on them whereas you know, Palmer amaranth does not have these hairs. Another species that will resemble pigweed that I see is uh, Virginia copperleaf. However, um, if you look at you know, this picture of Virginia copperleaf on the right versus this picture of Palmer amaranth on the left, you notice that you know, Palmer amaranth kind of has that white watermark on the leaf. In addition, if you take, if you pull a leaf of Palmer amaranth, it'll have a really long petiole. The petiole of Palmer amaranth is as long as leaf or longer. Whereas with Virginia copper leaf, um, the petiole's not that long. So in summary, uh, know what weeds need to be managed and know where, where these weeds need to be managed, whether it's gonna be in your lawn, uh, your landscape bed, uh, your vegetable garden. Treat the disease, uh, not just the symptoms. Simply spraying the weed, is, yes, will probably cause it to die, but you're gonna leave a huge gap in your yard or your garden where more weeds can come in. When applying herbicides, any herbicide, whether it be synthetic or organic, be sure you weed, read the label. And finally, uh, happy weeding. I'll put, here are some additional resources that I have found very helpful, especially in making this presentation. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much, Kurt. Um, we did have a lot of questions come in to the chat box. Um, okay, so the first one was one of our participants has broadleaf on their slope um, and they're looking at erosion control. I think that may be just the common. I'm not really sure if there's a question there. Sorry, Molly, if there was a question, um, feel free to put that in the chat box and I'll get to it. Um, we had someone ask for suggestions for treatment of wild strawberries. Um, like I said, it's kind of hard for me to give specific information um, without knowing what the site is. Um, for most of the stuff that's available to you, um, your hand pulling is an option. Uh, for broadleaf weeds, especially in 
grassy areas. Uh, we're going to use something that contains uh, 2,4-D or triclopyr because again, those are selective herbicides. They're not going to kill your lawn. Um, other areas, uh, you're not necessarily worried about killing what's killing. Um, other areas, you can do like a broadcast application of Roundup. That usually works well. Okay. Um, what is the correct mowing height? <laughs> Such a thing. Uh, correct. What is the correct mowing height? That's a good question, and the answer to that is uh, need to know what kind of grass you have because your different turf species, whether it be a bluegrass or a Bermuda grass, will will have a recommended uh, mowing height to keep that turf as dense as possible. I am not a turf grass specialist, so I cannot tell you what that correct height would be for your particular uh, situation. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, in general, I thought I had a counter here. Uh, Oh, I, I guess, yeah, I guess it don't. I had, I thought I had a general comment about certain turf species and mowing heights, but I guess I deleted it. Sorry. But yes, um, good, good to know what kind of turf grass stand you have or what, what species you have and for that. Got it. Okay. Next question is what concentration do you apply the borax to to control ground ivy? Uh, for borax and ground ivy, let me see. Um, usually want to dissolve about 10 ounces of borax in two to three gallons of water and apply that solution uh, uniformly to, an, to a, like a thousand square foot area. Um, however, uh, you know, selective, selectivity with borax is achieved for a specific problem. Um, there can be problems if that borax solution is misapplied though. Uh, for example, if the solution containing 10 ounces of borax is applied to only 250 square feet, both the ground ivy and the turf grass will be destroyed. Um, if you want to apply borax to smaller areas, you want to dissolve about five teaspoons of borax into one quart of water and apply that solution uniformly to about 25 square feet. Got it. Okay. Um, we had a lot of comments about violet and also clover. Some folks kind of let it stay for the pollinator value. Um, is that something that you've seen? Um, that's really up to you. If you want, if you like pollinators in your lawn, um, then uh, you can certainly leave, leave the clovers in. If you want your lawn to look like a golf course, then of course you're, that's something you want to get rid of. Yeah, I think we, we have a lot of more like naturalized lawns in our, in our program. Um, a lot of folks asked about a remedy for Japanese stilt grass, which I think you went over and I think these questions came in before you got to that part of the presentation. Um, okay. We had a comment to watch out for chagers in stilt grass. <laughs> um, will corn gluten work as a pre-emergent for stilt grass? I have not seen any research that suggests that corn gluten meal will work as a pre-emergence for stilt grass. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, they want to see the resources slide again. Okay, let me share that. The second to last one. And while you're sharing that, the next question is, would you use the cut stump method for kudzu? Uh, yes, the cut stump method would be applicable for kudzu. However, cuts, 
cut stumping kudzu. Uh, may take a lot of work because you'll, for one thing, you'll have to find that where, where that kudzu is actually originating from. And then, and then cut the plant. Got it. Yes. Uh, cut sample applications are generally very effective on some of those uh, vining weeds. Great. Okay. Um, how can you reduce garlic mustard? How can you reduce garlic mustard? Uh, my I've really never worked with garlic mustard. Um, my first instinct would be to, uh, to spray it with something uh, like glyphosate or 2,4-D. Okay. Uh, again, it's something, uh, garlic mustard's another one of those weeds that it's invasive. So it's really adapted at colonizing those empty areas. So you get rid of garlic mustard, um, make sure you have something to replace it with. It's basically the best pr practice. Got it. All right. Um, so we are at the end, almost at the end of time. We didn't give folks a break before and we only have a couple minutes now. Um, so the time is now 1047. We're going to be starting our plant diseases update with Dave Clement at 1050. So with that, thank you so much, Kurt, for presenting for us today. Really appreciate and, it. Great to meet you. <laughs> and one more thing I want to add about garlic mustard is uh, you can mow it and cut the flowering stems at the ground level before the seed starts to set. Got it. Good to know. All right. Thank you. So folks, we're going to take just a two minute break here until 1050. And at that time, we're going to have uh, Dave Clement on to do our plant pathology update. Thanks, Kurt. The calls on them, you know, or emails on them, I should say. And then, you know, they're not, they're not pathogenic. Okay. But they are exciting to see. It's kind of fun. Uh, some of them are kind of, uh, you know, interesting. This is a bowley that actually has pores instead of gills. So some of these are prize, you know, mushrooms that mushroom hunters go out and collect and so forth. So just keep in mind that, you know, some of these, you have to know what you're doing. if You're going to collect these things. This one, however, this one, this tiny, you know, this little group here, that's sort of a nice little tan group. That one is a pathogen. That one's our malaria. And our malaria is a, a root rot. You know, it's a, it's a mushroom that signifies that, you know, it's actually growing on, it can grow on, you know, old roots and old wood, but it typically then moves from old wood and uh, attacks plants if, if they're susceptible or if they're, you know, weakened in any way. So just be, just be aware that there are certain mushrooms, I'm gonna show you some more, that actually indicate that you have a problem and that you have a root rot or a you know, wood decay problem. So something like this, I would keep an eye on the symptoms of the tree, for example. Here's some, uh, I just was on campus yesterday and unfortunately, you know, along the mall, they're lined with oaks and this is uh, an Ionotus uh, root decay organism. So, you know, something like this is a bad sign. You know, this is not something to ignore. Uh, these, these are indications of, you know, severe root rot, severe trunk rot. That type of thing. So, you know, you don't want to ignore these types of things. You want to make sure you call an arborist or have an arborist uh, come out and uh, inspect the trees. And so, in, you know, in the case on campus, they have their own arborist uh, and they have, you know, a crew that goes around and inspects the tree. So, you know, something like this where it's attached to the trunk of the tree or a root, you know, is more serious. Here's another one. This is uh, a Ganoderma. You know, this is this is on a crab apple, but you know, it's a nice wood decay fungus. It's, you know, indicating that the tree is basically being attacked. Uh, so, and you'll see symptoms in the canopy. You'll see dieback, you'll see browning or leaf loss and things like that in the canopy. So it doesn't go without symptoms, but oftentimes these organisms go unseen for long periods of time until they fruit in the fall or produce structures, you know, later on in the fall. So fall is a good time to actually look for these things and to diagnose problems on trees. So uh, if you do see these things again, um, you know, you're gonna have to ask an arborist or call an arborist 
to actually do, you know, uh, an evaluation. Uh, because of the wet weather, we've had some plants go down to root rot. So here's a big rhododendron that was in the landscape for a long time. But, you know, obviously with, depending on where you were in Maryland uh, this summer, uh, lots and lots of rain. So this plant obviously was standing in water and, you know, rhododendrons, azaleas, uh, anything in the ericaceous family basically is prone to root rot. So, you know, this plant succumbed to wet soil. And one of the ways, uh, if, you, if you actually look closely at this root ball, you can see the roots are off color and they're actually kind of brittle. And if you pull, if you pull on that, uh, on a root tip, you'll oftentimes, you know, the outside will slough off, leaving the center of the root. We call that rat tailing. So it leaves a little white string, you know, protruding out there. So you can kind of tell if you examine the roots closely, you know, how healthy they are sometimes by pulling on them and things like that. But in this case, it was kind of obvious, you know, the plant was basically. So if they wanted to replant in that area, they'd have to amend the soil, they'd have to change drainage, or maybe even make a raised bed, something like that, so that you know, it's just not in a, an area that collects water. So a, a lot of our shrubs are in that situation. Um, hollies, especially all the Japanese hollies are susceptible to root rots. And we've seen quite a, quite a few this year uh, with root rot problems. So again, managing moisture, managing drainage, managing the, the site. Use are another one that basically, um, won't tolerate any kind of saturated soil. So those three plants, you know, rhododendrons, Japanese hollies use, those are all very susceptible to root rot. So they're almost an indication that you have a bad drainage problem in most cases. Um, again, fall is the time of year when you're gonna look for, you know, decay issues. So uh, this one actually is on the Capitol grounds, one of our IPM scouts as a, uh, as a uh, job there. Um, and so when you see these kinds of uh, wounds on trees and then you see this black discoloration, that's hypoxylon. So that's a root decay organism. Sometimes it's shiny. Um, it can be off white sort of grayish color too when it's really early. But a lot of times this, this blackening is an indication. It's a pretty clear symptom of hypoxylon and that gets in and it's a wood decay it gets into old wounds it gets into stress trees and so you know again the evaluation of that tree really needs an arborist or in some cases if it's a small tree and you see this you know you know that it's going to have to be removed um, so again on oaks it's the same thing we see an awful lot of this on declining oaks this is on the surface of the bark, but it, the, the fungus, remember, penetrates deeply into the wood tissue and often causes black lines. If you cut a, if you cut a tree cross-section, you'll see the black lines as a result of this fungus invading the actual roots uh, in, and trunk. And it gets in, you know, into the wood fiber, so it causes a decay. So again, structurally, you know, it's going to do some damage, and so this is an outward, you know, sign or symptom of that organism, you know, doing its damage. And it often shows up, you know, sort of later on in the season like now. So good clues, you know, if you're looking at uh, pictures or if clients are bringing in samples to you and they, they describe this kind of stuff or the pictures that they take, you know, these are indications that you've got severe decline and dieback. Uh, this is an interesting uh, symptom on oak, primarily white oak. Uh, this is not a pathogen, but it is a, uh, a fungus that actually lives on the surface of the bark. We call it a smooth patch. It happens on other species of trees too, like uh, sometimes on uh, tulip, uh, tulip poplar and uh, tupelo, black gum. Um, but anyway, on white oak especially, you'll see these patches on the bark. And they're not pathogenic, but they do sort of make that bark sort of an off color, a white in other words, or sunken in some cases, it'll actually be a little depressed, but it, it's non-pathogenic, doesn't go into the wood, doesn't go into the tree, doesn't hurt the tree, but it's almost an indication. You can almost tell the species of oak by, you know, this, this sort of organism on the bark because it primarily gets on white oak. 
and swamp oak and things like that in that in that family. Uh, again, you know, because of uh, some of our moisture stresses this this summer, and and in some cases it was drought. So here's a viburnum, for example, that has dieback in it and quite a bit of dieback, and and this is caused by the canker fungus Botryosphaeria. Botryosphaeria is an opportunistic fungus. Uh, it attacks weakened plants. Uh, rhododendron, I mean, I mean, rhododendrons are also susceptible. Uh, viburnums are susceptible. You know, various shrubs are susceptible. Um, this is a leather leaf viburnum, usually a pretty tough plant, but uh, you know, up against the building and it's you know hot. This is on campus again. You know, no no water, <laughs> all these kind of good things. So. Um, pretty stressed and that's where botrysphere comes in and it cankers the stems you know it, it actually gets into the stem tissue and colonizes it and, and cankers those stems so you really no sprays but you can prune this out it just depends how severe it is you know as you're pruning basically try to prune below the last symptom here here's a canker on a on a rhododendron just to show you the margin on the right here is where the you know, the, plant, the the twig is dead, and as you cut or scrape the bark, you can kind of see that it's a living, uh, you know, farther back, but you'd have to prune back to good wood. You have to prune back to healthy wood, so that's okay. So, um, lots of leaf spots this year, so on hydrangeas, lots of leaf spots on hydrangeas this year, and that's that's one of the weaknesses right now on hydrangeas. Hydrangeas are very popular. Uh, a lot of people have them in their yards and so forth. And it doesn't really matter whether you have the oak leaf or the, you know, the big uh, you know, blue, you know, macrophyllas and things like that. They all sort of have a tendency towards uh, your susceptibility to these leaf spots. This is a sarcospora leaf spot, but it doesn't matter what, you know, fungus it is per se, but uh, they are breeding for resistance. I mean, that's a big thing right now. They are trying to select cultivars that have more resistance because I think this is one of the weaknesses of hydrangeas in their landscapes. There's not much you can do about this. I mean, unless you're going to spray it, you know, religiously and, you know, every two weeks, something like that. Um, so you kind of put up with it. It does, you know, defoliate somewhat. Uh, it does weaken the plant somewhat. But usually they rebloom. Usually, you know, the flowers are, you know, it doesn't get on the flowers. So it, uh, it's usually okay. But it is a weakness on, on hydrangeas that, you know, you just have to be aware of. And I think most people can tolerate it. But, you know, you'll, they'll bring it to you and ask you what it is. And so it's a minor leaf spot in most cases. This was an interesting uh, sample. Uh, we got in this summer. It's a spice bush, but it actually has virus symptoms in it. So all of that mottling and yellowing and sort of the line patterns are, are virus symptoms. Um, no cure for that, but I just thought it was an interesting picture, so I threw it in there. Um, it's sort of an oddity, but uh, it's interesting when you run into these things occasionally. Uh, on roses, we're still seeing rose rosette. That's that... Uh, you know, bunchiness that, you know, that growth that basically um, is, you know, this bunchy growth. Um, here it's sometimes green, sometimes it turns brown. Uh, that's an indication of this, of the virus infection. So you really, uh, again, simple pruning isn't going to control that entirely. You know, you have to basically remove the plant. Once you know you have a uh, rose that's infected, you know, you should really remove the entire plant. Now, you can replant right away. Remember, it doesn't, it doesn't survive in the soil. It needs living tissue, but it will survive in roots. It will survive in, in uh, you know, plants. So just remove the infected plants. Uh, you can replace with, you know, healthy roses, but don't, um, I would space them so that they don't touch. You can have a you can have a grouping of them, but don't let them touch because the vector is a mite, and that little mite can you know can crawl and climb and and move basically. So I think I just have some more pictures here of symptoms. Uh, it typically gets a little more red sometimes, or it's bunchy. It's smaller flowers. Now don't confuse that with new growth. A lot of our 
darker roses do have a red growth when the growth is new. So that's just normal. So don't confuse that with the rose rosette symptoms. So just, just be aware of what cultivar of rose you have. So that watch your roses, you know. Um, and you'll know if, if this starts to turn, you know, odd and bunchy and so forth. But, you know, normal growth can be, you know, this red color. And of course, there's still lots of leaf spots on roses. Most people don't don't worry about these. Um, you know, again, black spot was the worst, you know, foliar problem that we used to have on roses. So uh, these these other leaf spots, for the most part, are fairly minor. They're fairly um, non significant. They will cause some defoliation. Um, but in most cases, you know, people aren't going to worry about it. So, uh, again, just be aware that there are other things out there on roses. I mean, there's powdery mildew on roses. There's other things. There's downy mildew on roses. But for the most part, you know, the resistant roses are resistant to black spots. So that makes them fairly good landscape plants. Oh, boy, dogwoods, dogwoods, dogwoods. Well, you know, dogwoods really suffered this year. Um, this is my dogwood, actually you know, in my yard. So it's got old El Sinoe. It's got powdery mildew now. It's uh, had some drought issues because we were a little dry in my neighborhood. Um, so yeah, dogwoods are pretty, pretty uh, sad looking right now. Um, you know, it, it goes back to, you know, making decisions about, you know, whether or not we should spray these. Most of the time I, I tell people don't worry about it. But for this year, I mean, it really hit them hard with the early leaf spots. And then, you know, the powdery mildew now is in the, is getting worse uh, as we get into the fall. So, uh, you know, it does, it does cause some damage. Um, and so, you know, it's, there's, there's sort of a decision whether or not you want to actually go out there and start to spray dogwoods, you know, next year, early in the spring. It's too late to spray them now, of course, but you know, if you wanted to start next year, you know, how much would you do? How many sprays would you put on that type of thing? Or would you go with a resistant cultivar dogwood? So um, again, you know, here's a close up of the mildew right now. Um, fairly, fairly heavy this year. So it's causing some leaf reduction. Uh, it's causing some loss of, you know, uh, vigor. Um, there it is actually on leaves without the white coloring. It actually causes necrosis underneath that, that white growth. So just remember that it is causing damage even if you can't see um, that, that necrosis. This was the El Sinoe in the spring. Again, it was really just hammered this spring. So between these two diseases this year, the dogwoods have really suffered. Uh, just remember that there are resistant ones that you can purchase if you're going to replace them. And that's what I would recommend. I'd recommend replacement with uh, one of the resistant ones. It just makes life a whole lot easier. Uh, and here's a list of them, just in case you wanted uh, a list. But again, uh, it's it's you know, one of those things I, I think that, you know, it's it's appropriate for you to consider, you know, this this other alternative as a replacement. Lilacs this year, this fall, I should say. Lilacs this fall, they're really beat up looking. I don't know if you can even tell that's a lilac, but there's a few stems there. And actually, it's trying to put out new growth. All the old foliage is actually, most of it's fallen off. So, again, horticulturally, you know, you need to prune these things. You need to thin them. Uh, and this particular spring, you know, our spring was wet for a long period of time. We actually had bacterial infection on some of the leaves and then right now we have mildew on them so it's actually knocking the lilacs back a little bit but old french lilacs kind of look this way unless you rejuvenate them it's one of the things you sort of put up with but you know what they still flower usually if they're in full sun they still recover they're still pretty vigorous so again horticulturally you'd want to do some pruning and thinning and you know some rejuvenation on these but uh it's old, it's old foliage has fallen off. I think they'll be okay. They'll still come back next spring. You know, and here's mildew that normally attacks lilac. Again, it's a little more benign on lilac because it's a later mildew. 
the difference between early mildew and late mildew. So it's a late mildew, so it's not quite as damaging as the dogwood, which is an early. Uh, and again, just remember on our shade trees, sycamores, oaks, tulip poplars, you know, uh, everything is, is prone to mildew at the end of the season, which is not a serious problem. It's not something we worry about because the leaves have already had a chance to, you know, photosynthesize and do their thing. So again, on shade trees, most of the mildews are not, not important. Boxwoods, we're getting some calls on boxwoods. This was a good year for boxwood blight. Uh, Boxwood, Blight. Boxwood Blight was pretty heavy um, this year. So fall is really one of the times of the year when you have um, a longer period of infection. Uh, we, it, it's in yeah. Boxwood Blight's active in the spring as well as in the fall. But in the fall, I think it's actually worse. So we're actually starting to see these symptoms come in now. You know, pictures, people are sending in pictures of boxwood blight. So uh, again, just to diagnose this disease, remember it's a heavy defoliator. It defoliates the plants rather quickly. So that's a difference from the old diseases. So look for fallen leaves. Uh, it will form resting structures in those fallen leaves. So again, removal of the leaves or burying the leaves, all those dead leaves have the potential to spread the disease. That's what makes this, you know, really a hard uh, thing to, to fight. Uh, you'll see the leaf spots. The initial symptoms are leaf spots and then the black lesions on the stem. So it's a, it's a pain, you know, on these older boxes. If you get this disease, you either have to do a lot of pruning or removal, or you're going to have to spray on a regular basis. Um, remember, this is these are the older boxwood diseases, Volutella and Macrophoma. These are okay. We've dealt with these for many, many years. They don't cause the defoliation, so and they don't cause the black lines or the leaf spots. So just remember that when you're looking at boxwoods. Look for that defoliation. Look for the black lines on the stem as a differentiation. And again, I have not seen the new the new resistant ones, um, but they came out this year, the new gens. And so there's Freedom and Independence, which are the two resistant ones. I guess they're gonna come out with a few more. Some of the older ones, you know, like Derunk and so forth, um, Wintergreen have, you know, some resistance, but they're not immune. And actually the new gens are not really advertised as being immune. So they're highly resistant. So again, it remains to be seen what these uh, new boxwood varieties are gonna do in our landscapes. So just be aware that they are, they're out there. Um, they might be an option if you have to replace, you know, your older boxwoods or something like that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't just throw the new ones in there uh, because they're not immune. They could still spread disease. So just make sure that you keep them separate or replace all of them at one time. Some other interesting diseases from this summer, we saw quite a bit of southern blight on plants. So here it is on the delphinium, and it forms those tan structures, those sclerotia that stay in the soil. So that's a good diagnostic thing. We saw quite a bit of aster yellows on echinacea. Aster yellows forms these little green uh, growths in the, in the seed head of the flower, the center of the flower on echinacea. So again, no cure, you have to remove the plant but it's a, it's, a, it's a diagnostic symptom. Uh, powdery mildew, again, this time of year, I just wanted to point out there are resistant, you know, plants out there. Uh, I just think this is a cool monarda that, that replace some of your susceptible ones, but there are many, many choices. Here's, here's the leaf spot on Rebecca. Uh, again, we see an awful lot of this in the fall. This is particularly bad on Goldstrom. So Goldstrom is a variety, I think, that you'd want to avoid. Uh, there's a close up of it on the leaf, but they come back. On the left is Goldstrom, on the right is just another variety. So just pick re more resistant varieties, I think. And you can get a lot of this information from Mount Cuba. This is just to remind you guys that there are choices out there and they put out publications that you can you know, read. Actually, they're online. So you're, you, know, you can download them and find more resistant plants. They have them for phlox and coreopsis and things like that. So all, a lot of different plants. 
Clematis uh, with uh, Clematis blight or uh, stem canker was, was popular this summer. Again, more resistant varieties would be in the Vitacella group, which is, uh, you know, a little more resistant. It has a little, di little different growth form. Daylilies are looking like this right now if they're susceptible to leaf streak. But you can cut these back and they'll come back next spring. They're pretty tolerant plants. Just remember that, you know, remove most of that foliage and get it out of the garden. And uh, so that you don't, you know, it doesn't build up year after year. Uh, on turf, we had quite a bit of, you know, disease this summer. Um, for some reason, we just had a really good summer for turf diseases. So this is brown patch. Um, we were called in to look at this. Um, several ones actually. Uh, a lot of the ones in Montgomery County were actually, uh, people were complaining, they're, they're under a new pesticide law. So they basically can't apply most of the control options that we would normally either look at or consider. This is a commercial company, so um, they were looking for alternatives. And of course, in this particular case, it's just gonna have to be overseeding with more resistant turf type tall fescues. Get the, get the more resistant and follow the recommendations as best you can. If you can find the resistant ones, they're listed in our publications. Um, because really, you know, it's past uh, time to, you know, spray that. It's already dead, so you're going to have to go in there and, you know, just overseed and get a good stand this fall and, and get it established before next year. If you actually walk around in the morning, if you're a morning person, you can actually see the little threads of the mycelium on the grass blades uh, of brown patch. So you can diagnose it that way. Or, you know, if you're looking for spiders, you can see spiders too. So don't confuse spider webs with <laughs> brown patch. But uh, it's kind of fun to go out early in the, in the morning and now look at turf. Uh, we're still getting some red thread uh, out there. And believe it or not, so fall is another period of time when you're going to see some red thread too on turf. Um, we had some this spring, it sort of went quiet in the summer and you're going to see some in the fall if, if you have the right conditions. Uh, so this is already cropped up here in central Maryland. Uh, we get a lot of pictures like this right now of turf or lawns and you know they ask us well what, what can they do? So I guess I, I throw the question back on you guys a little bit. You know, that's that's what we would call a typical hell strip or, a, you know, a very narrow piece of ground between sidewalk and street. Uh, it's mostly crabgrass. It's all crabgrass. Um, so, you know, to to do that, you really would have to rip all of that up and prepare the soil, overseed it, water it, fertilize it if needed. Um, so, you know, a challenge might be to, you know, do some pollinator, you know, plants or something like that. Put another type of planting in a strip like that. Now, again, you're going to have salt, you're going to have water, you're going to have, uh, you know, maybe even foot traffic, you know, from public or whatever. So different, you know, types of things, but some ornamental grasses or some other flowering plants might be more appropriate. It, it would be difficult to actually keep grass, you know, going in strips like that because basically even when you try to fertilize, you're gonna spread fertilizer onto hard surfaces, which we don't recommend. So again, when, when, we, when we're asked to do difficult situations like this, I think it's good to give, you know, options, give, give other sort of alternatives perhaps Turf isn't necessarily always the best answer in all situations, but turf does a great job for, you know, holding soil in place and it has a, it has a place, you know, in your, in your landscape. It's just, you know, in situations like this, and I wouldn't plant, you know, trees in this either. You know, this is another thing that we see often, you know, when we see strips like this where they try to put in, you know, full size trees and you're going to have sidewalk lifting from the roots and just a difficult situation for, you know, getting the trees established. So, 
I finished up early, uh, so I was anticipating that I'd get some questions from you folks. So go ahead and give me some questions. Awesome. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of questions. Um, we always have a lot of questions on your presentations, Dave, which I think is great. Um, so let me go back to the beginning of them. Okay, so um, there's one folks, oh, sorry, one of our guests has browning ink berries. So they've got, it sounds like they have bushes side by side and one is turning brown and the other one is not. Is All right, ink, so inkberry is one of the plants that should take water. Although, <laughs> guess what? We do see Botrys fury on it. Uh, because oftentimes it will it will actually have drought damage or you know it'll actually suffer from higher higher temperatures so ink bear yeah just go in and, and prune or you know you can scrape the bark and look for those discolored areas um, it's not usually root rot although I've seen root rot on ink bear believe it or not but it's generally botryosphere it's generally stem cankers it's other things that you know come in on the stress plant got it um, and then the same person, should I worry about mushrooms at the base of Quercus stellate or post oak? Yeah, anytime you have, well, as long as it's not attached, but if, if it's right, if it's on a root, if it's on the trunk, if it's, if it's close. So if it's just growing on mulch, don't worry about it. Like the one picture I showed, yeah, mm -hmm. don't worry about the mushrooms in the mulch. But if they're attached and if they have, you know, if they look like Ganoderma or Armillaria or any hypoxylon, any of that kind of stuff, then that's what you want to be concerned about. Okay, cool. Um, do you treat our malaria? Can you save a tree from it from that? Yeah, that, that's a question we do get sometimes, and the answer, unfortunately, is no. You don't save anything from our malaria. So it's a it's a real um, it's a real interesting organism. I mean, it, it's it's a saprophyte most of the time. In other words, it grows on decaying wood and things like that. But if it has the opportunity on a weakened plant, it it moves in and it actually forms the rhizomorphs, which are those little black shoestring structures, and it travels. So when you remove plants in a landscape, I oftentimes suggest removal of the stumps and things like that to also. Uh, kind of get rid of its food source, but once it gets into a plant, yeah, no, no real cure. It doesn't kill it necessarily that year, but you'll see a slow decline as it continues to grow and colonize and, and cause problems. Okay. Um, one person wants to know if you can tell them anything about you death in the last couple of years, and has it been a result of root rot? Yeah, so the good news about yews is they don't get any other diseases except root rots. So that's the one disease they do get. So it sort of tells you if you have uh, a low area or if you have an area that's heavy soil, that's not draining right, or if you just have, you know, a heavy rain season and it happens to, you know, yews can grow for quite a, quite a few years, but then, you know, if you have a heavy rainy season, uh, they will they will not tolerate any kind of soil drainage issues. Okay. Um, next question is in regards to maple trees. There's several maple trees with lots of knots on the trunk and they kind of look like handholds, but they run up the trunk. Is there any idea what that is? Well, those are kind of interesting. Yeah, those are those are what we call burls, or their their growth, their adventitious growth, essentially on on you know from the plant tissue itself. And there's debates on what causes burls, um, but you know sometimes if they're big enough, you make bowls out of them or something like that. But there's no, they're not pathogenic. You know, they're not they're not you know something that's going to kill the tree. But they are interesting and they're curiosities in some cases. So no, no problem. That's good. Okay. I think that's a rare answer that it's not a problem. Um, are the plant viruses systemic or can you prune out the infected part? Yeah, the bad news about viruses are always systemic. So when you see it on rows, even though you try to prune it out, it's in the roots. So that's what we tested one summer, Karen, Rain, and I. We went around campus and we actually dug up plants. They allowed us to dig up some plants that were infected. And, and you know, we tested the roots, we tested the stems in between, we tested the leaves, we tested. And uh, guess what? You know, you can find the virus in the roots as well. So it's just when you see the symptoms on the leaves and stems, you got to remove it. 
Got it. All right, we have, I saw another PE question too, at least two PE questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that they're out of season, they have something on the leaves that look like yep. some sort of leaf spot, and they're in yep. a bed that does, a, it gets a lot of underground water. Will this damage the peonies or prevent them from blooming next spring? You know, uh, peonies are pretty tough. Um, so in general, if you just leave it, they do come back. Now, having said that, and being a plant pathologist, you know, I can't resist thinking that there are, you know, there is some effect on the leaf spots and they'll do everything that they get this time of year. Um, but for the most part, peonies have produced all of their foliar food that they need by July. So most of the time, the old foliage and so forth just kind of withers and dies and it looks ugly. I wouldn't leave it there. You know, I would, I would actually try to remove the old foliage and you know, get it out of there. I wouldn't even come, just make sure you get it out of there because it is, it does serve to perpetuate the disease even worse next year. So try to clean up your garden beds as best you can this fall. But it, the long shot is it doesn't hurt them. Okay. Um, and then the other peony question was what causes peony leaves to turn black? Yeah, that's the same thing. So it's the, the cladosporium. They call it measles sometimes, or they call it, you know, just black spots on leaves, but cladosporium is the fungus. And it's not a heavy duty pathogen. It kind of gets into weakened foliage. Okay. Um, we had a question that almost sounds like it might be another training, honestly, but someone asked if you could talk about plant immune systems or how plants fight off diseases and viruses. Yeah, that could be a whole lecture. So, you know, <laughs> Just real short, you know, the plants do respond just like we respond to infection, right? But they don't have a circulatory system in the same way that we do. They don't have a similar, but that, you know, the more we research plants, the more we understand that they actually produce a lot of defense compounds. So they will produce defense compounds. They will, um, you know, transport some of those defense compounds around inside, but it's not quite the same as our immune system where you have antibodies and, you know, antigens and things. But it, they will uh, communicate. They will try to wall off infections. Uh, they do a lot of fun. And that's where molecular biology, you know, is coming in and molecular plant pathology in particular is studying a lot of these mechanisms, trying to figure out which genes are turned on, which you know, pathways basically are important to resistance. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, the next question, um, if someone's wondering if the hot drought spell weakened the plants and then the heavy rain hit and then maybe that caused the fungal diseases to explode? Well, both of those are extremes, right? So just, you know, it kind of just points to the fact that as as gardeners, we just have to kind of keep our plants going as best we can. Um, you know, where possible, we gotta we have to water during droughts, and where possible, you know, we have to manage drainage mm -hmm. and correctly so that our plants don't have, you know, those conditions where they're sitting in, you know, heavy saturation. Now, some sometimes we can't help it, but yeah. you know, if, if we can, if we can at planting time, if we can anticipate, you know, drainage problems or, you know, things like that, and then add irrigation during droughts, that's what we have to do as gardeners, really. Yep. Um, we have one guest that has major problems with southern blight in a new sunny bed. Any advice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, southern blight is really a problem because it stays in the soil. So it actually comes in on plants, too. Sometimes when you actually, you know, uh, so the best thing to do is uh, that's the one time I actually recommend removal of some of the soil when you remove the plant, if you can do that. And then I would turn the soil, if possible, in that location when you replace the plant, because burying those sclerotia actually, um, if they're buried deeper than six inches, they won't germinate. So try to do that and try to keep the mulch away from the crown so that, you know, it's just that moisture, you know, that's right there at the base of the plant. If you can sort of let that soil dry out a little better. And again, um, in some cases it is, it's hard. Got it. Um, okay, we removed the aster yellows affected echinacea. Would it help to also remove the asters that have volunteered in the garden as well? 
Well, most of the asters that come down with uh, aster yellows, um, it's a vector. It's, it's, it's vectored by insects. So it's the plant hoppers and leaf hoppers and things like that that sort of fly in. They, they feed on weeds. They feed on other things. There's a reservoir of, you know, that organism out there in some of these wild plants and so forth. So I wouldn't go crazy. It's not going to spread necessarily. If, if the plants don't have symptoms, they're, they're free of disease. So when you see the disease, you know you have it, you just remove it. Got it. All right, we have someone with a very large silver maple that got a tar spot last year. It returned this year. Um, it's a windy area, the leaves blow away, so raking never happens. How to get rid of the spot, I guess is what they mean, and they're saying that the leaves are smaller than usual on their tree. So the good news about tar spot is it's not a heavy duty pathogen. It will cause some leaf defoliation, but it's just a cool organism. I mean, if you look at it, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's not a heavy duty pathogen. So if you have smaller than normal leaves, it's probably not from tar spot, it's from other reasons. So again, it's, it's a foliar pathogen, but it's not, it's not a heavy defoliator. It's not a heavy duty, you know, uh, decline type organism. So I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. Um, just breaking for a moment, for those that are keeping track of time, um, this presentation ended technically at 1130. We are going to keep doing Q&A because there are some more questions. Um, but if you need to take a break and you want to come back and join us, um, John will be starting the fruit and veggie update at 1140. It's currently 1132. So you have a couple minutes to take a break if you don't want to stay for Q&A. All right, next question is, what's the best way to prevent or control early blight in tomatoes, potatoes, and other crops that get it? Well, um, there are, believe it or not, there's resistant, you know, varieties on tomatoes. You can, you can look for the actual, you know, abbreviation for early blight uh, resistance. Now, if, you, if you're growing heirlooms and things like that, you're not gonna see that, right? So on early blight, on tomatoes, I'm just going to focus on tomatoes right now. Um, you're you're basically looking at a moisture thing, so you can actually physically remove those lower leaves, actually almost prune them after the plant gets some size, so you re actually reduce the humidity around the plant. You can actually mulch around the plant too. Mulching actually helps because if you have bare soil, those spores can be in uh, old plant debris and things like that. I would rotate if you could, but a lot of people can't. But you know, you, if you mulch, if you reduce the, the actual, you know, the canopy a little bit so that you get a little better air circulation and just uh, water at the base, try, try to get the water, you know, just at the soil, not, not on the foliage. Now, some varieties are more susceptible, some varieties, and you're gonna get early blight and septoria or one or the other or both. Um, so actually, um, those foliar diseases, you know, just crop up. Um, you can actually root, you know, sort of plant in, uh, you know, have second plantings and things like that. If it's really bad, you can actually, you know, come in with a second later planting, you know, get rid of the first planting. And But you're going to have to manage it that way. The other way, of course, would be with a fungicide. And commercially, that's what they would use. They would use, you know, a rotation of fungicides. So you could use your your copper-based products, you could use your dacanels, you could use your, you know, whatever's labeled, that type of thing. But a lot of people don't want to spray their vegetables. So again, just management organically would be, you know, the pruning and the mulch and, you know, careful water. Okay. It's the varieties, if you can find them, if you want to grow those. Um, another uh, veggie disease-related question. Um, I think someone has had powdery mildew on some of their squash crop over the summer and they're asking yeah. about replanting a fall crop where there had been powdery mildew. Yeah I mean some of those varieties but you know like I've looked in the catalogs you can get resistant squash to, to mildew. It's, it's not complete resistance it's tolerance and so you might want to try that. Uh, the later you plant your squash sometimes you can avoid the squash vine borer you know if you plant mm -hmm. late. Again um in the fall, you're gonna get mildew on your squashes and pumpkins and things like that. So uh, there's a there's sort of a trade-off as to how late, um, and those spores are airborne. So again, um, you know, some, you just are gonna to have to put up with a little bit of that. 
But uh, yeah, it does knock, it knocks the leaves off, it reduces the yield. So it's mm -hmm. something when you're starting like your first planting a squash, if you're not gonna success your plant or whatever, um, you know, just kind of keep the, the foliage dry, can't keep it in an area of the garden, maybe where you get a little better air circulation. Okay. Um, and someone asked about late blight on tomatoes. I know we talked about early blight. Now we have a question about late You know, blight. late blight, I don't see it very often. Um, it, it can occur, it usually occurs in just small portions of the, I'll let John actually address that if he wants to, because that typically is a, is a periodical disease that we don't see every year. Uh, but in some years, yeah, it, it, it can be, it's, it's worse during the sort of cooler, rainier parts of, the, so it can get started in the spring or something like that, but it usually, it's not usually everywhere. So I'd be curious to kind of see where they're actually getting it. But there, there's a late blight, res, there's late blight resistant tomatoes that you could, you know, tolerance anyway. Okay, so Samantha, if you have any... Um, you might want to ask right. John about those. <laughs> um, all right, uh, now we have a kind of a fruit question. Are there any plums that are resistant to black knot? I don't know. I don't okay, know. We can ask John that question too. I don't probably. know if, I know, yeah, I can't. I, <laughs> top of my head, I don't know if the Japanese versus the European versus. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, we we'll ask John that one. So John, just the heads up, prepare. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So we have one guest. They've had a hydrangea for 15 years, and then it didn't bloom this year. There's not any other diagnostic information, but if you have any initial ideas about maybe we had a lot of problems with hydrangeas this year. Yeah. And a lot of it was the late freeze. You know, we had a mild winter, so they did fine. But then we had that late, those late freezes really set them back sometimes. And so in some cases it killed the, the actual buds. Uh, in some cases it killed the stems uh, so that, you know, they had to regrow. Um, I don't know. Maybe next year will be better. Um, yeah, hydrangeas really had a hard time this year with the late freezes. So, mm -hmm. wish you luck next year. Okay, and then we had a question about the oak, sudden oak death. Um, uh -huh. They've lost several mature oaks in the last few years with no real diagnosis, and they want to wonder what's happening. So on the sudden oak death, um, we don't have it here. That's the good news. Just say, just it's not here. <laughs> we talk about it because you know it's it's in other places, but it's not here, and that's a good good thing. So all of the oak death and all of the oak decline and so forth. We've written some blogs on that. We've written some uh, articles on that. It's a combination of weather factors and stress factors on similar age trees. You know, most of our forests were logged several times. So the actual age of most of our forests are about the same. I mean, they're, they're all between, you know, 80 to 120 years old, something like that. So these are trees that, and even in our neighborhoods, a lot of these trees are similar ages. So. They're all coming up to that sort of, you know, late uh, middle age, kind of like my age. You know, they're kind of like, they're getting a little gray, they're getting a little bit, you know, uh, stressed. And when they do run into stress problems, either environmentally or, you know, a new street was put in or new wires were dug or something, but it, even if it wasn't, you know, just the age factor alone in some cases, you know, you had that bell curve. so. A lot of plants do live to, you know, a ripe old age of 100, let's say, or 85 or 88, and, you know, they decline and they start to go down, especially when we have droughts and then we have flooding or then we have, you know, we have these combinations of weather factors. Um, it just adds up. And so in some cases, yeah, we're seeing that across the state when it's not, it's not just one, mm -hmm. seeing that pretty much statewide and up and down the East Coast a little bit. Uh, we're seeing, you know, oaks pretty much declining and dying uh, in neighborhoods and in forests, actually. Actually, in, in forests, uh, Stanton Gill actually has, uh, he had his forest logged for the summer and actually had quite a few trees that were dead in the forest. Um, mm -hmm. You know, then they were all about the same age, so. 
I, I can't explain it uh, that there's one thing. It's just a phenomenon. I think we're starting to see. Uh, it may stay. It may actually occur for quite a few years until we get a new set of you know younger trees. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Great. Um, and then the last uh, question that we have was about watering tomatoes to avoid blight, which I will let John take over because we are it's 1141. So we are going to switch over to our last presenter. So Dave, thank Thanks. you. There's a lot of great thank you comments in the chat. Always appreciate thank all you. the info you have. Thank you. All right. So John, if you're ready, we're going to switch over to your presentation. Looks like you're good to go. Awesome, we see your screen, looks great. And I've got your uh, polls, so just let me know when you want me to run those. Okay, good morning. Good to be with everybody. Let yeah. me, um, yeah, maybe I'll keep my video off to help with the bandwidth. And um, I wanna thank Steph and Jean for putting this great continuing ed event together. Um, I'm gonna be sharing some of the issues that we've been seeing um, come in through the Ask an Expert platform. And I know Gene is gonna put some links into the chat box uh, that'll give you some additional information regarding some of the, um, the problems I'm gonna be sharing with you. And also most of, um, or a lot of what you've heard this morning, you'll find um, information on the HCIC website. So please, um, you know, refer to that, search it, and um, <clears throat> check it out. Excuse me, I got something in my, my voice. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is um, talk a little bit about the HCIC website and some of the updates that um, we've been doing. Uh, you may have noticed that the old IPM series fact sheets are being slowly transformed into dynamic web pages. And we've done boxwood, um, we've done azaleas and rhododendron, we've done flowering um, fruit trees, dogwood, and more to come. And so with those dynamic web pages, we've got some nice photos and uh, revised information. Insects, um, a big shout out to the UME AGNR entomologists that have helped us since Mary Kay's retirement in June. Uh, it's much appreciated. Emily Zobel, Stanton Gill, Paula Shrewsbury, uh, Peter Coffey. And so we've been able to revise and update a lot of our information. Spotted Lanternfly, we're going to continue to add new information, especially because we're now actually getting folks who are seeing um, nymphs and adults in their landscapes in Cecil County. And so there'll be some control information coming shortly. Also, I uh, just learned about this yesterday, uh, Doris Banke and her Cecil County Master Gardeners have a really cool new thing called the um, Spotted Lanternfly Water Bottle Challenge that people might want to check out uh, by going to their website. It's to get the community involved in learning more about this really difficult invasive insect and um, how they can uh, stuff as many as they can get into a uh, soda bottle to win a prize. So that may be something other counties will want to look at as this invasive insect spreads. Uh, Emily wrote a new Asian longhorn tick uh, page for us. It's on the website. And of course, Brood 10 of uh, the 17-year cicada is going to be with us this spring, so we have updated our information. We have three new soils pages, uh, as well as a fertilizer page. That, that is coming, the fertilizer page. And this winter, we will be revamping the vegetable and fruit pages. Um, a lot of our content in this area went up after the last, um, the Great Recession, when Grow It, Eat It got started. So we really want to get back to those pages and improve them. And um, I wanted to mention that Ask an Expert is being upgraded um, by the National E-Extension Group. They got a big USDA grant to do this. 
And so this fall, um, hopefully, it will be launched. It's going to be called Ask Extension. And it's going to incorporate artificial intelligence so that when people uh, type in some search words, type in the, the kind of problem that they have that they want help with, the system will put forth um, some resources that are you know, geographically relevant and topic relevant. And if the client, you know, still feels like they want to ask a direct question, they can. So it's going to, you know, we're going to continue to have that direct consultation uh, ability with clientele. They can, you know, continue to send photos as well. Um, and now I think what I'd like to do is um, quickly share a different screen. Uh, See, I don't see it. Okay, let me see if I can get to everybody see the HCIC website screen. Yep. Um, so right now, of course, uh, people can go and ask us questions by um, clicking on th this button and the form appears. But I wanted to also let folks know that you can also view recent questions and answers. And this may be really helpful for people that are answering questions that are coming in from uh, their folks in their counties or in Baltimore City. So what you'll see when you click that uh, button are questions that have been assigned to HCIC and then questions that we've answered uh, in the last day or so. The other kind of cool thing is you can go over to these tag words on the left and for example, if we click vegetables, we'll see all the vegetable questions, questions that had vegetables as a tag word. Um, and we can, you know, click on any of them um, and see what the question was, see what the answer was. So it's, I think, pretty helpful as we're going through the season to see what's going on. A lot of these questions, as you scroll down, you'll see are from Maryland. Montgomery County, Baltimore County, Baltimore County, uh, Montgomery County, Baltimore County, and so forth. So, uh, and of course, if the client included photos, you'll you'll see those as well. Okay, so um, wanted to talk just a minute about some of the um, things we've been seeing around climate, and this is um, a web page from Oregon State University Extension. Over the last few days, you can see what their concerns are, um, climate and wildfires. Um, you know, we luckily don't have to deal with ash on our vegetables, but that's a major issue right now. Uh, climate, you know, if you've been gardening or farming in Maryland for the past few decades, you've seen changes. Um, we have saltwater intrusion and in farm fields on the Lower Eastern Shore. A lot of us remember 2018 with the 73 inches of rain and what kinds of challenges um, those presented for, for us trying to grow food crops. And just a few of the, the summary highlights so far this year, um, you know, Baltimore recording um, a record number of days over 90. Across the state, um, the warmest January through July period, the third warmest, I should say, on record. And as Dave pointed out, there have been dry locations, um, areas of Maryland this year. On average, we've had the fourth uh, wettest August. So a couple of the things we've been um, noticing, and these are some things that you know we have to address with clientele. Um, this spring, uh, early May, we had some extraordinary freezes and frost across the state that really negatively impacted a lot of fruit plantings. And it's a, it's a thing, of course, we're going to expect to have late frost, but what's happening is with climate change, um, when we're experiencing warmer temperatures in early spring, um, we're getting, you know, advanced bud development, uh, flowers are popping out quicker, we may get fruits forming earlier. And so when that late 
freezer frost comes, it's even more damaging uh, to the crop. The high uh, day and evening temperatures are a real concern, especially the evening temperatures. Um, throughout most of central Maryland, we're usually or often uh, in the upper 70s through a good part of July and August. Um, of course, it varies by specific location, whether you're near um, a heat sink or a heat island. But um, this is having a big effect on pollination, fruit set, uh, tomato, pepper, bean, and squash and pumpkin and other crops are all affected. And we're seeing crops mature more quickly. That could be a good thing. Um, I have a winter squash that I grow that um, should take 90 to 100 days. And this year, at day 72 after planting, I was able to start harvesting. Also, fruits um, in this kind of environment may be softening on the plant and, and sun burning more frequently. Something that we've been picking up on um, from several clients is uh, white fly that seem to be there in their gardens year round now. Uh, this used to be a problem we associated with, you know, greenhouse bedding plants, vegetable transplants, you know, bringing those into the garden in the spring. But now for people that have uh, leafy greens going pretty much around the year, maybe they're protected with a row cover, uh, white fly populations are surviving in parts of central Maryland, which is a concern. And we're also getting more visits from the so-called southern pest. Um, a good example is pickle worm, which can be a really devastating pest of um, cucumber, pumpkin, melons. And uh, this year, Virginia and mid-Atlantic pumpkin growers are facing this pest. It's a little bit unusual for it to be coming up here in great numbers, but it does uh, fly in, it's a moth, the adult is, and it flies in on storm fronts. So with more uh, storm events, uh, we're likely to see this, this pest more frequently. Another example is the yellow striped army worm. Some of you may be seeing it in your gardens, but Penn State put out this alert um, in September. It had always been considered kind of a minor pest uh, but they've been having pretty major damage in some fields. And um, this is another one that uh, typically only overwinters uh, as far north as the Mid-South, maybe the Carolinas, Kentucky, but the geographic range could be moving, uh, you know, with climate change. And um, this is another one where uh, instead of the adults flying up on storm fronts, we actually get the young uh, larvae, the, the early end stage larvae will produce silks and they'll actually balloon up into the, you know, um, into the air and get carried north on storm fronts that way. So maybe you've seen it. Um, this is that, that insect, which can actually look quite differently depending on the environment and what it's eating and its life stages. Um, but uh, it, it is in the cutworm family, Noctuidae, and it, it does a lot of scarring damage on a wide variety of vegetables, but it can also bore in, as you can see in the lower left there. So that's the yellow striped army worm. I noticed um, visiting community gardens and neighborhood gardens, um, and in my own garden, more heat damage, like direct, uh, the lower right photo, that's a, a bush bean planting. So young leaves that are actually just sort of frying, uh, this was in, in July, uh, on the plant, and uh, upper right is tomato. And sometimes, you know, overwatering or poor drainage um, symptoms can look similar. We can get sort of a wilting of uh, leaves that would look similar to what we see with the tomato in the upper right. And on the left, I really don't know exactly what happened to this cucumber. I'm thinking it, it had uh, been sort of hidden and then 
was exposed to full sunlight. Um, and that's another example of um, kind of a burning injury from uh, heat or reflected sunlight. And what's interesting too is we didn't have big uh, ozone problems on plants this year, but there are air pollutants that can also cause symptoms that, that look like a burn injury. Um, so more climate effects. Um, I bet a lot of people recognize this, even if you don't know the name of it, you saw it on your tomatoes and peppers. Um, this is a very common problem. It's a fungal disease, uh, anthracnose. And I'm showing it to you because uh, we, we can see it fairly early on in the season once fruits are ripening, but it does, um, it is more um, prevalent later in the season. So along with um, a lot of the splitting and cracking that we see later in the season, um, this is somewhat preventable if people do pull their fruits when they're first turning. I know you've heard me say it before, but I think this is um, a really good tip for our clientele. As soon as fruits start to turn, bring them inside, put them on the counter. They'll ripen just fine. The texture, the flavor will be identical to what they would have had if they let the, um, the fruits vine ripen. And I wanted to share this um, photo with you because it's a, a little unusual in that we expect to see blossom and rot symptoms you know, on the outside of the fruit, on the bottom of the fruit, a sort of a tan to brown to dark brown discoloration. It'll be sunken. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is I've been trying to read more about some of the new research that's coming out. And I think Jean's gonna put a link into the chat box from the University of New Hampshire about this. And um, there, there's some thought that uh, through studies that the, um, rather than a calcium deficiency causing blossom and rot, the thought is that blossom and rot is causing the calcium deficiency. So just a quick summary, they think possibly that lush growth uh, combined with different environmental stresses could be what's precipitating a reduction of calcium in the fruit. So we can have a situation where there's plenty of calcium in the soil, plenty of calcium in the plant, in the fruit, and yet we still get blossom and rot symptoms. So we'll, I'll be uh, trying to learn more about that. Um, of course, taking care of the plant, keeping it well watered is still, you know, gonna help prevent uh, a lot of problems, including possibly this one, but um, we'll stay tuned. Okay, Steph, I am going to just introduce this slide. Um, we've got a tomato that's got a big symptom on it. And I'm going to stop sharing um, so that Steph can uh, bring up the poll question. We want to know what you think might be causing this symptom. You can keep sharing, John. The poll will be up anyway. Oh, okay, cool. So it's up right now. Um, I am seeing the results come in. And it looks like lots of people are voting we've got 50 people so far just so you guys know this is anonymous in case anybody was worried <laughs> we won't know who guessed what so just go ahead and take your best guess <laughs> it's neck and neck Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> we've got 148, so a little bit over half that have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and I'm gonna share the results so everyone can see. So it looks like Factorial Fruit Spot was the winner. Okay, <laughs> are you ready for the big reveal? Yep. Ooh. 
Oh. Oh, man. <laughs> so um, this is super common, and the symptom is referred to as cloudy spot because it really it's the photo I think is pretty much in focus, but it looks really cloudy, doesn't it? That symptom. So stink bugs, and we have four different species. Um, green stink bug, southern green stink bug, brown stink bug, brown marmorated stink bug. They um, insert their mouth parts into the skin. Um, there's an enzyme in their saliva that can cause some of this symptom, but as they extract sap from the, from the uh, plant cells, air is entering the plant cells and it makes the area kind of soft and puffy. So, um, for those of you that you know have seen this and know that um, it can be a huge problem, um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot a gardener can do, even with organic insecticides. This is a very tough insect to control. Uh, a lot of people don't even see them. You might see a few on the fruits, but they're, they're very secretive. And um, so my feeling is, the best um, approach is really to take a paring knife and remove the damaged parts. You can try to uh, give your plants more room, do heavier pruning to provide less habitat so they don't have such a you know hospitable place to do their feeding. But without synthetic uh, insecticides, uh, very difficult to control. Okay. Oh. So, yeah, okay, so I did want to talk just a few minutes about um, this family. We get a lot of questions, and I'm sure you do too. And um, so th there are quite a few insect and disease problems of cucumber, squash, melon. And um, so starting on the left, powdery mildew, we've seen a lot of that today, um, especially late in the season. Uh, can be a problem. Dave pointed out there are resistant varieties and all master gardeners should be familiar with the Cornell University website that um, lists a, um, a series of Excel files uh, for each of the major vegetables and it, those include all the resistant varieties and they keep it up yearly. So it's a super resource. Um, they include commercial as well as home garden varieties. Um, next to that, Coenephora is a, um, a fungal infection that will uh, get into flowers and young fruits. Um, and we had more of that probably this year because of weather conditions. And then there are a bunch of other uh, leaf spots, you know, principally um, target leaf spot, anthracnose, angular leaf spot. And the most significant for commercial folks is downy mildew. And that photo on the right, actually those symptoms look pretty consistent with early downy mildew uh, symptoms. So sort of pale green to yellow spots that look somewhat angular uh, and are confined by um, leaf veins. However, the same symptom is not uncommon in cucumbers where there is no downy mildew infection. And the way we would know it's downy mildew typically is that disease is gonna progress. Um, and so we're gonna get necrotic areas, the leaf's gonna to start to turn brown, the, those lesions will coalesce, the leaf will brown. On the underside, before it turns brown, we'll get a mat of dark purple to gray mycelia. So, it's a fungal mat on the underside of the leaf. If you don't see that, I can't tell you exactly what's causing that symptom, um, except to say it's probably a combination of nutritional status in the soil and the plant, plus environmental stresses, which is something we see. Um, but um, so lots of disease issues, insect issues, abiotic issues. And um, on top of that, this year, maybe because we've had so many new gardeners, which is fantastic, um, we had a lot of people who were concerned about a, a flowers dropping, 
small fruits dropping, not getting much or any or enough uh, squash in particular, but also cucumbers. And part of this, I think, is that quite a few people are doing container gardening and squash can be difficult to grow, especially if you're not using a compact variety. There aren't that many, but if you're not using a 15 or 20 gallon container, uh, summer squash can be pretty difficult to grow. It can be that it can be stressful for the plant. And so just a couple of tips I think that might help, especially our newer gardeners, is to really pay attention to what these plants need to grow well. You know, the spacing, the amount of sunlight, good rich soil, regular watering. There are, as I mentioned, um, you know, the disease resistant cultivars you can share with people that are on the Cornell website. There's uh, also some research uh, being done and some plant breeding work around uh, parthenocarpy. So we know that there are um, squash varieties that can set fruit without pollination. And Jean's included a link to um, a little Cornell study about that. It's about seven years old, but there are some newer varieties coming out. Um, and I think this is driven in part by climate change because of the pollination and fruit set issues. You know, we need to come up with more varieties that don't need pollination to occur in order to produce fruit. So Delaware is working on this with their cu pickling cucumbers, but we should be seeing more of that. And lastly, and Dave mentioned this too, which I think is really important, um, you can get around um, more, more than the diseases, you can get around several of the insect problems by planting later in the season. Mid-June planting of cucurbits can really um, help and it probably can help with diseases as well. So I, I would recommend that people try that. You lose a month, you know, but um, you may end up having plants that can hang in there longer. Last thing I'll say about this, we have to help our new gardeners understand that not all vegetable crops can be planted in the spring and make it to frost. In fact, very few of them will, you know, technically uh, and in a good season, maybe our eggplant and pepper and, and tomato would, but, uh, you know, beans, we get a three to four week harvest if we're lucky on bush beans and then they're gone. You know, pole beans, yeah, we would like to keep them longer. Uh, cucumbers, five to six weeks would be a great harvest period for cucumbers. But I think people's expectation is I planted it and it really should go all the way through the end of the season. Squash should last a longer time unless you get these, you know, disease and insect issues. So when we're gardening organically, we're not spraying. I think a good strategy is to think about, you know, succession crops, um, more than one planting of uh, these vulnerable crops. Uh, so here's another example, beans, especially in community gardens, I see a lot of Mexican bean beetle injury and I see the plants just languishing there. Uh, until they're crispy practically and the, the beans are just you know going through then another life cycle so pulling plants up when the production is going down and maybe the pest problems are going up we we'll call it a destructive harvest you know you just yank the plants out of the ground strip off the good beans those are in the bag there and then the beans that aren't so good or overgrown or dragging the ground, or, you know, in contact with the soil, we can, you know, compost those. And we actually have a little video clip of this on the HEIC YouTube channel. Okay. Um, okay, let's talk about bean roots here. Um, th this will be our second poll question in just a minute. Um, so on the left, we've got a bean plant that's been pulled out of the ground. Those nice little round uh, nodules were um, produced by the plant in response to an infection by the rhizobia uh, bacteria in the soil. And of course, these are the bacteria that uh, fix nitrogen, take the atmospheric nitrogen, and convert it into a plant available form. A little bit of that nitrogen is actually available to the plant during the growing season, but most of it's available after the plant decomposes. Um, 
So that's great to see. Uh, on the right, we have something a little bit different. And so I'd like you all to um, let us know what you think might be causing this swelling of these bean roots. And I uh, will give you a little bit of time to answer that question. So I saw there was some issue with the last poll, just a couple of folks who couldn't see it. So if you can't see the poll, make sure that you have your Zoom window up and that you are kind of actively clicked on to the Zoom window. If you have other things open on your computer, just minimize them for the time being so you can see the pop-up poll. Got a pretty strong consensus on this one. I'm not going to influence the audience like they do on the quiz shows. <laughs> All right, so we're almost at 150. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results for everyone. There we go. That is great. Um, you all did wonderful. It is root, not nematode. I like rhizobia robusta. Those are the imaginative people out there. That's, but I, I think, you know, that would make sense too. Some of these rhizobia nodules don't just look like perfect spheres. So, um, this one was a little bit tricky, but um, it definitely is root, not nematode. Let's see if we can get that up there. There we go. Um, so I did want to share this because we, in, in doing our plant diagnostics, it's easy to sort of forget about it unless somebody does pull up a plant that's symptomatic. And in this case, the client did have a, uh, a garden with a bunch of different crops. This was the only one that seemed to um, be growing very slowly. It just, you know, there was no explanation because it was getting everything else it needed. And so when um, they pulled the plants up, you know, we were able to clearly see it's root, not nematode. So this is a, a fairly common plant parasitic nematode in uh, Maryland gardens and farm fields, and it has a wide host range. So it's just something to think about where, where the symptom is, stunting, poor overall growth, and there don't seem to be other good explanations. You know, if the client's willing to yank that plant up, then you can uh, possibly see if this is um, a causal factor. Um, every year we know we're going to see 2,4-D drift uh, injury to tomato and grape, but unfortunately we're continuing to see, well, we don't like to see that, but we're also seeing a problem that was much worse in the early 2000s, and that is um, some long residual herbicides that end up contaminating straw and manure, um, compost, uh, are still ending up out there in the in people's gardens and farms. So this was a person in Washington County, out in the country, big country garden, gets um, manure from a neighbor farmer, and then we, she starts seeing these symptoms, not just on tomato but other vegetable crops. And so it, you know, I think the message is uh, it's great to get free compost, free manure but um, you may want to ask some questions about it or even uh, test the, the material. And the way to do that is a bioassay where you actually take some of the mulch or the manure or the compost, put it in a container with some grow mix, uh, soilless mix, and plant some bees or <laughs> peas or beans uh, to see how they come up or if they come up and if they don't germinate well or they come up distorted and you can see 
this classical uh, distortion from phenoxy herbicides, twisted leaves, cupping, um, elongated leaf points, um, then you'll know that there's a problem there. So just something to be aware of. This is becoming uh, a more prevalent pest. It's garlic bulb mite. So add this to the list. You know, we know we have white rot, uh, which is can be a really serious problem on garlic and onions. Uh, there's the bloat nematode that Jerry Brust has written about uh, on the UME website. Uh, this year, I ended up getting bulb mites in my garlic, unfortunately. So it's a, it's a, you can see the mites at the bottom, they're magnified, they're quite humped in shape. Um, they feed right where the roots meet the bottom of the bulb, right at that plate. That's where they enter the bulb and they just feed right there at the bottom um, and, and basically ruin the bulb. And uh, that allows some secondary pathogens to get in. The um, sort of way to deal with it or the best ways we know of is to try to buy the cleanest seed stock that you can buy, rotate your crops. This mite can live in the soil if there is residue there over the winter. If you leave garlic and onion, you know, plant residues, they can survive. Otherwise, they shouldn't be able to, um, to overwinter. And Jerry has written some nice things that are on the uh, UME website about this pest. Here's another one that's uh, new to us, not to Maryland yet, but um, this is one I've been hearing about for 20 years that started in New York. It's from Europe originally, and it's it, it moved all throughout the Ontario and uh, Ontario growing area and uh, New England. Now it was found right at the border of New York in north central Pennsylvania this year, and it's it's pretty tricky pest. There are multiple generations. This one isn't moving north, it's moving from the north to the south. So it can apparently overwinter just fine. Um, in Pennsylvania, we'll see how it does, uh, you know, if it continues to move southward. But it's a, um, a type of fly, a midge is a fly, so the little maggots that hatch out um, will feed on different parts of the plant and that they affect the physiology of the plant and that causes cupping and distortion and smaller heads uh, with cauliflower and broccoli. So nothing to worry about right now but just to be on the lookout for and you know we'll keep you updated on that. I've been sharing the Allium leaf miner information uh, the last few times we've met. It, it's established in Maryland. It can survive over the winter in the soil in Maryland. Um, it's another one that came from, I think, Europe and Asia. And um, first was reported in Pennsylvania. It's in Maryland. Two main flight periods, so two generations where you'll have the uh, mated females laying their eggs on allium leaves and the um, the maggots will then you know work their way down through the leaf to it depends on the type of plant but toward the base of the plant so row cover is the way to go i think uh, with this pest putting it on as soon as seeds go in the ground or plants go in the ground uh, april to early may and then again late August through late September. And spinosad and neem are also effective. I don't know how many of y'all have been hearing about the um, Asian jumping worm. Um, in the chat box, you can watch a really entertaining video. Joyce Browning in her Garden of Whedon series uh, covered this uh, invasive. It's not new. It's been in Maryland for decades. Uh, it's I think prevalent across a good part of the US now, at least Midwest, upper Midwest, um, Mid-Atlantic. And um, it gets uh, between, I think one and a half and eight inches long, so it can be quite large. 
one of the distinguishing characteristics is this milky white, very smooth uh, band that goes all the way around the worm toward the head. It's called the clitellum and it's not raised at all. Um, it's a kind of a shiny looking earthworm. Uh, it is creating huge problems with our ecosystem in that it just absolutely rips through the organic matter in the soil and it granulates soil so that we end up with these aggregates that look like um, little bits of gravel. People describe it as coffee ground. Um, but what's happening then is we're getting uh, more air between soil particles so roots will desiccate. Um, nutrients that come out of the castings from the swarm are leaching down through the soil so it could actually lead to more nutrients moving into waterways. Um, we have a few links in the chat box. Um, we probably got eight or ten um, questions this year and several photos um, of, of this worm. So be on the lookout for it. If you see them and you can grab them, put them in a plastic bag, we want to try to destroy them where we see them. Uh, they overwinter in cocoons if it's super cold. Um, I may be even also super hot if the soil warms up to a certain degree that could affect their ability to continue their life cycle in the summertime because there are multiple generations. And then over the winter, extreme cold can also interfere with their cocoons and um, their ability to survive. But it's one we'll be keeping our eye on. It's not a, a pest that um, anybody is tracking in Maryland. So if you see it, you know, let us know, send a photo. Um, but we talked to DNR and MDA about it. They're, they're not tracking it at all. Didn't cover uh, anything on fruit other than this uh, fig that I'm gonna talk about for a little bit, but I'll be happy to answer any fruit questions. Um, I guess my message as always is, please try to um, talk to your clientele about tree fruits and how it's better to start with small fruits, especially if they wanna grow organically. And don't get into tree fruits other than a few that we know don't have a lot of major problems, like fig, unless you've done some research and you're prepared to deal with you know, potential pest problems. So I just thought um, I would share one, we, we actually got a number of questions this year on figs not fruiting. And I think for a lot of people um, in Maryland that have fig bushes, even if they didn't cover them, uh, their figs came through this past winter. If we get temperatures in the 20s, the low 20s, we can lose all the above ground wood on fig. The roots almost always survive. And if the above ground wood is killed by very cold winter temperatures in the spring, we get new shoots to grow and those shoots may produce some figs, but they rarely will have time to mature before the end of the growing season. So it's hard to know exactly what's going on. In these cases, um, the clients weren't sure if the figs um, were grown on second year shoots that had come off of wood that had survived or not. So if, you know, the, um, the, if on the left side here, even though that's a pretty good sized plant, if the, um, if this was all new growth from 2020, if all this growth came up from the ground, we wouldn't expect that we're going to have figs. If we have no figs though at all, if we don't even see a single little fig, then it, it could be something else going on like excessive shade. So pruning, uh, especially a lot of the internal branches, out can be somewhat helpful. If it's just a really shady location, you might need to consider moving the plant, which is not easy to do. You might wanna just start off with a new one in another location. Um, this last slide here, and th this fig in the middle, looks like it's growing next to a wall, which can be helpful if it's a south facing wall, um, but it looks like it's growing between two row houses. This was from Baltimore City. Uh, or on the side of a row house. So I don't know how much sun it was getting. It looks pretty healthy, but again, no figs. 
um, where you've got really good soil and the plant looks healthy, uh, it is possible to root prune figs. I, I see this a lot in Baltimore with uh, Greek and Italian gardeners. Sometimes they use some kind of root containment uh, like corrugated metal driven down into the soil or they may actually go in and cut through roots um, you know around the circumference of the tree to try to force it to fruit so you know we do have some information on our web page on figs and then also it could be just the wrong cultivar for the area some people get a fig from a family member and that fig uh, you know originated somewhere that uh, would make it not appropriate for Maryland growing conditions. Uh, I think the last thing I wanted to just bring up are some of the nice newsletters that you can uh, subscribe to if you're interested. So this is for you super duper veggie fruit people that want to know what's going on. These are commercial newsletters, but they contain some very relevant, you know, information. Um, these are some that I subscribe to, and of course the UME newsletter is listed first there. Also, um, Jerry Brust has a nice commercial vegetable page uh, on the UME website, so there's a lot of good information there as well. So thanks folks, I didn't even check the time, I hope we didn't go over. Um, nope, you're good, we're right on time for... Oh cool, good. And um, I'll, of course, I'll take questions. And also, I think Jean included in the chat box a link to a survey uh, for me for today. So with that, I'll say thank you and take questions. Awesome. Thanks, John. Lots of great comments um, and lots of good questions, too, as usual. Um, so I wanted to start with the one that we ended with um, from Dave, the um, best way to water your tomatoes to avoid blight. Yeah, well, Dave covered it, really. I mean, um, don't get your foliage wet. Remove those lower leaf branches. A thick mulch might be helpful. Uh, pruning, more uh, heavier pruning to improve air circulation um, for prevention. And then resistant cultivars. I'll mention um, there are some that have purported uh, early blight resistance and some that are supposed to be resistant to late blight as well as early blight. And you can try them. A couple of examples for early blight, Mountain Magic, um, Mountain Supreme. I think um, Juliet and Jasper um, are a couple of others, but I don't know how good that resistance is. It may be tolerance. Now, when it comes to late blight, there are cultivars that have really good genetic resistance to late blight. If that, if you feel like that's a problem in your part of the state, usually if we're going to see late blight, it's going to be in the western counties, Allegheny and Garrett. Um, this year, uh, there have been reports, one from New York, there was one from Pennsylvania in the past three weeks. There's one from Western North Carolina. So it's very spotty, as Dave mentioned. The last big outbreak epidemic was in 2009 for Maryland. Um, so there are a bunch of good um, late blight resistant varieties. Um, you can find them online. The Cornell website lists them all on their tomato page uh, as well. And uh, Cornell's got a whole research program to develop more varieties because it's a bigger problem for their state. Got it, thank you. Um, and Emily put a link into the chat for um, the person who had asked about uh, black knot on corn. Yeah, I'm not aware of any black knot resistant plum cultivars. He's got a link from Cornell in there, so um, that should help. Um, Anthony had a question about our frost dates, first and last and are they changing? Yes, they are changing. Uh, you know, USDA changed their hardiness zones. What I, um, I think the best thing to do is just check your local weather forecast. You know, that is the best way to figure out what's going on out there. Um, so they are changing, but 
the problem is we can have an early frost in the fall and we can still have late frost in the spring, even with climate change. So it's a much more dynamic kind of situation where you just have to keep your eye on things. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, let's see. What is a frost blanket? <laughs> Um, it's probably something heavier than the heaviest uh, kind of reme or floating row cover. The nursery industry uses them. And um, I don't know how thick or what's in them, but they're, they're used to completely cover a plant. So you're not going to get sunlight coming through. Um, if, if the question is about winter protection, it really just depends on what you're trying to protect that would be perfect for something like a fig where, you know, you're just trying to cover it over the winter. There are other, um, you know, leafy greens. It's probably better to go with heavy reme, um, where you're only going to get 50% light transmission, but it's, you know, heavy enough to protect down, probably gives you eight to 10 degrees of frost protection. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right, we've got a question about two purple kiwi vines that someone has had for four years, but they've never produced fruit. How can they tell if they have two of the same gender? Um, if they're flowering, let's say I'm trying to think, right, you need the two different, um, two different varieties. Uh, I'm not, you know what, I'm not sure to tell you the truth. If that person could send the question through the website, we will research it for them. Perfect. All right. So I'll send it through Ask an Expert. Yeah. Next question. Would a white row cover be better than a dark shade cloth to mitigate very high temperatures? Right. So shade cloth is different than row cover. Shade cloth, 50% um, shade cloth is what would be recommended to reduce um, the heat around the plant and to reduce sunlight. So a row cover will increase the temperature around plants. So we would not want to use that during the summer. It's great in the spring to, you know, move growth along, but uh, in the summer, it would be better to use shade cloth. And I didn't mention this, but I think really part of the answer to dealing with adapting to climate change is going to be planting our vegetable crops um, in some cases where they're going to get more afternoon shade. That's less expensive than buying shade cloth, but uh, shade cloth is pretty expensive, but I think uh, it is being used more, shade cloth is, by even commercial growers, especially further south. So I think it's something we're going to be seeing more of, but don't, don't use white row cover material in the middle of the summer. That'll increase the temperature. Okay. Um, regarding the tomato that had the stink bug damage, do you just cut out the damaged part and can you still eat the rest of the fruit? Yes, yes. If you're processing your tomatoes, you may end up cutting out quite a bit. Um, but yes, you, is once you cut out the damage, you can use the rest of the tomato. Okay. Um, one guest has peppers that were doing well for a long time, but several started to show deformation from broad mites. What can they do to prevent the mites? Uh, yeah, we do. We get cyclamen mites and broad mites. Um, that's a tough problem. I don't know. Uh, you know, th there's nothing you would necessarily be spraying, and I'm not even sure. We have some information on our website about that. I'm not sure how well they overwinter. People see those occasionally. I don't know that you're, you'll necessarily see them next year. Um, they, if they bought transplants, they may have come in on transplants, but check our website. And if you don't feel like you get enough information that way, send a question through uh, Ask an Expert. Got it. Okay. Um, if a cucumber does not have downy mildew, but it has yellow spots on leaves, what could be going on there? Yeah, well, again, it, it could be another type of disease. It'd be really helpful if the plant is still available to take photos and send them through Ask an Expert. And, um, uh, you know, uh, photos of the symptoms, close up, 
and we might be able to diagnose it for you. If it's not downy mildew, it could be an abiotic problem. It may not be a disease problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, if plants don't need pollination, does that mean the fruits are seedless? Uh, that's a really good question. It means there may be small seeds um, in the fruit, but they won't grow. They won't get large. Um, so yeah, I'm curious about that myself. They'd probably be like nascent small ovules, but um, they, they won't grow in the fruit. Okay. Um, we get this question a lot, so it's something good to remind everyone about. Is it sensible to compost affected plants? Oh yeah, it's a, it's a great question. The problem is it requires a nuanced response. And as I've, in teaching Master Gardeners, I've told folks, um, you can talk to four different plant pathologists and get four different answers um, from, from them about that very question. So example, um, there's certain disease plants you never want to put in the compost bin, like if late blight is an issue um, or white rot or something like that on alliums. There are others that as long, as, and this is the big caveat, as long as all the tissue that you're putting in the compost pile that was infected is gonna reach 130 or 140 degrees, it would be okay to compost it. Like tomato vines that have septoria and early blight, those diseases also can blow in. They're kind of cosmopolitan. We can't really get away from them. So if you have a hot compost thing going and you're really conscientious about it, you can um, effectively, you know, render it harmless by composting. So it really just depends on the disease and how you compost. Got it. All right, next question is, what about pesticide and herbicide residual in leaf grow? For all of the commercial compost, you can go to their website and see their latest uh, test reports, which include um, pesticides doesn't include all pesticides, and they may vary as to which ones they um, are having their compost tested for. So that, that would be my advice, just to go to their website, see if you can find the report. If you can't, then call them and ask, or email them, and they'll send you the report. Um, they, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of what all, um, I can't remember with leaf grow what they test for exactly. Um, I think I, I'm going to just leave it there. <laughs> just check the test report. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, okay. We had a question. Can you talk about perennial broccoli? I don't know anything about perennial broccoli. Okay. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so that, whoever asked that can educate me about it. I'm not sure what that is. I know what, um, you know, the, what do they call it? The giant collards, the um, perennial collards and kale. I know about those. Those are pretty interesting. So those are plants that you can't really get seeds for. I think you have to get cuttings. So this may be something similar, um, but I, I don't know perennial broccoli. Okay. Um, the next question is, what's a good way to cover them using burlap? And I think this is in reference to the figs. Yeah, with figs, um, it depends what you have at hand, really. Yeah, burlap uh, could work. Uh, bags of leaves collected from the neighbors, whole leaves, and they don't need to be mulched, then they're, it's really heavy, but if they're just whole leaves in bags, they're nice and light and fluffy, and you can pile those around the tree. Um, and what I do is I bend my branches down to the ground, I weight them down, and then I just pile la uh, bags of leaves over. But you can do all kinds of things. I, I had a barber from uh, Genoa who used to cover his fig bushes in Baltimore County and put a little 110 heater under there. He'd plug it in on a thermostat. So people do all kinds of crazy things <laughs> to try to make sure they get figs next year. Awesome. Um, another fig question, which cultivars of the fig are recommended for this area? Yeah, so that's all on our website. The three I always put out immediately are Brown Turkey, Celeste, and Hardy Chicago. A lot of people grow those three and they seem to be pretty reliable, but there are others as well. 
Okay. Let's see. And Jean did put the link to John's evaluation in the chat box. So please make sure that you guys are doing that evaluation for him. Um, what's a good combination of fungicides to prevent and control blight in tomatoes? Organically, copper would probably be the best that I'm aware of based on research results. Actually, copper plus, um, oh shoot, there, there's one of the um, immune booster microbes that you can add to the copper that um, would improve the performance. And I can't remember which one it is, um, but maybe I can get that information back to everybody. There, Kate Everett's in the southern and the uh, Lower Eastern Shore has done research on fungicides for um, cucurbit diseases, uh, but I think also um, tomato diseases. And it seems like that there's some combination with copper that might even be more effective. And then there are synthetic um, fungicides that you can use like mancozeb and uh, dacanil. We don't recommend those. I mean, when Grow It Eat It started, we decided we're not going, we're going to play it organic all the way in terms of uh, pest management. And um, we think people can be successful that way, but there are synthetic materials available. Got it. All right. In a fenced area, what could be eating sweet potato leaves? maybe squirrels or mice, there's no rabbits or raccoons or groundhogs spotted in the area. If the whole, if it looks like wildlife, like ragged tearing, um, I, I don't know. If something probably is getting in, I doubt it's mice. Rabbits would be might. I don't know if they like sweet potato leaves, but if it's more, if it looks more like beetle feeding, like, um, there are a number of beetles uh, and caterpillars that'll feed on those leaves. The good news is they're so prolific, it's probably not gonna affect you know, the, uh, the harvest. Okay. Um, what causes pepper plants that were doing great to suddenly wilt and wither beyond recovery? And they do have voles and moles in the yard. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it could be something feeding on the roots or undermining the root system if something was tunneling like a vole. But if it's in a wet area, there are also some diseases like Phytophthora, um, even verticillium that um, can cause a plant to collapse. So hard to say, um, but that, that's a little unusual. Mm -hmm. So um, again, if that person wanted to send photos and details through Ask an Expert, we might be able to suss it out with them. <laughs> All right, is there a good tumbler composter that you recommend? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't been keeping up with that, so I really couldn't tell you. Um, I would say a bunch of the Master Gardener programs have great composting uh, programs. And uh, I know Anne Arundel County is one of them, Baltimore County, a bunch of them, Frederick County. I don't want to leave people out. So there should be somebody in the chat should be able to help this person, um, even though I know they're not necessarily testing tumblers, uh, but there may be some master gardeners that are real excited about a particular type of tumbler. Okay. Um, should I be concerned about the Asian jumping worm in any worm castings if I purchase worm castings? That's a really good question. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the industry is doing, like the folks that are raising um, the uh, red wigglers commercially. I don't know. I, in fact, I think I would just ask them, if you're considering buying red worms, ask the company, like, how do I know there won't be any Asian jumping worm cocoons in, you know, what I'm buying from you. Um, I'm sure it's, it, it, it may be an issue for them. I don't know. I don't really know. They're, they're, they're pretty small. I think, what did I read? I don't know. Read the uh, information on it. I can't remember the exact size of the cocoons, but I think they would be pretty hard to, uh, to see on, on a casual observation. Yeah, it sounds like um, it would be a good question for the organization or company where you're purchasing them from, just to double check. 
All right, so that's the last question that we had for you. Thank you, John. There's a lot of really excellent comments in the chat, appreciating all the info. Oh yeah, well, it's great being with everybody and keep gardening, stay safe and vote. Yes, absolutely. So thanks everyone so much for joining us today. I know it was a long day and we're a little bit over time, but it's so much great info, really helpful. I hope you guys all enjoyed it. We really appreciate seeing everybody and all of your kind comments in the chat box. Thank you guys so much. We'll get the recording out to everybody. We'll have it posted on the HGIC YouTube channel. And I know a lot of folks have asked about the presentations and the links within the chat. And so we will be sure to get those out to everybody with the recording as well. So thanks again for joining us. It's Friday. Have an excellent weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next time.